All right, good afternoon, everyone. I am here with sort of a surprise live stream with uh, I, my friend, uh, Carl Benjamin, is who you might know as Sargon of Akkad or the host of the Lotus Eaters podcast, which I watch actually pretty regularly. In fact, my, my wife is a huge fan of it. So oftentimes it gets turned on when we're in the car. So, uh, but I'm really happy to have you here, Carl. Yeah. And uh, I was hoping today um, to give a be bit of an introduction. Uh, this live stream is happening because, uh, and you know, academic agent is might disown me for this, but I was watching Carl on Adam and Sitch's show. Actually, I clicked on it basically because I saw your name, and I, I saw sort of the first of half of a conversation that I desperately wanted to hear Carl talk about, and and somehow uh, because of the other guests, the conversation kept on running away from the most interesting question that you guys were discussing. And I was just, it was the most frustrating thing imaginable. And then the, like the day after that conversation happened, uh, people told me that you also wanted to speak to me. And I'm like, the stars have aligned. Let's have a, let's have a revisitation of a uh, you know, conversation we haven't had for a really long time. So Carl, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, yeah, I've wanted to speak for ages because, as I said before the show started, um, I've been I've been watching all of your live streams just on on your channel because they're they're actually great material for when I'm painting. You know, it's like uh, yeah. his his like two hours of Dave exploring the thoughts on the current state of the world, <laughs> and it's it's just a good good thing to have on in the background because it's you know thought provoking and there's I, there's no need for me to look at the screen, right? So it's fantastic material. But I've been I've been following like you know your work, Aaron McIntyre's work, you know mm. AA's work, you know. And, and but in the same in the same breath, I have to follow everything that the left is doing, the mainstream is doing, yeah. right? And so I, I'm I feel like I've got a foot in each camp, you know. And so I have to speak to the mainstream, but I'm also paying attention to what the sort of dissident right is doing, mm -hmm. and 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 you know dissident left movements. Although places like BreadTube and stuff like that have clearly burned off, and but uh, they've run out of fuel. They've run out. I of think steam. BreadTube's dead. I mean, I, I haven't heard about it at all. It's it seems to have completely disintegrated into just cults of personality. Like a Vosh yeah. isn't part of bread tube. Vosh is just part of oh. the Vosh phenomenon. Yes. And the same thing is true with people like Keffels and hmm. uh, I don't know how far we can go down. <laughs> but, but they're just time wasters on the internet. Cause the way I look at it is like when bread tube first started, they were at least arguing something. It was mm. nonsense leftist uh, talking points that were essentially designed to uh, like reinforce the current power structure and uh, genuflect towards the institutions, which is fine. But at least you can understand. You know, you you watch them because you want to understand how they think and what you know. They they can uh, they can show you. You know, everything is a big self report, uh, and so that's fine. You know, what's the what's the animus that drives them? Um, but now, like you say, it's just devolved into cults of personality. Even yeah. contrapoints is too afraid to make strong statements on things. You know, philosophy wow, tube. Yeah, ContraPoints is interesting because if you re if you watch ContraPoints' videos with a discerning eye, it's it's almost like an SOS of a right winger trying to escape from a left winger's body. And right, yeah. And the problem is is that ContraPoints' Twitter career belies the exact opposite opinions. And if you read that individual's Twitter, they're just a dyed in the wool orthodox leftist. They don't deviate from talking points at it's all. It's the only thing that's safe. It's the yeah. only thing that's safe. But the subtext of all the videos is yeah. the right wing is right. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I can't I and the only way I can admit it is through is through these these sort of many layers of irony. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Many, many layers, layers of irony. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and but the, but this is the thing. So I, I I don't really watch like, you know, the big bread bread tube stars. Now, not because I don't find any of the work interesting. It's just, I don't think they've actually got anything left to say. And so there's very, uh, but the, the distant right is clearly trying to understand itself. And mm -hmm. so, uh, it, and the response it has to Peterson, I think is particularly interesting because like academic agent is like, there, there's, there's, there's this theory, oh, the distant right is currently purely purity spiraling. It's like, yes. And you've got someone like academic agent who's very much pushing that forward. Uh, but that's okay because really you guys have to work out what it is you are, 
what it is you want, you know, what it is you can offer. And this, I think, has to be a painful process, right? And it, it has to be literally the flaying of one's own skin to, to like, as Peterson would have put it, actually, 95% of your personality is dead wood, burn it away, see what's yeah. left, you know? And, and this is going to be a difficult and painful process. But I do think it is a necessary one. So, I, like, I see people critiquing academic agent for like, oh, he's he's just you know causing infighting. No, no, he's driving at something. He doesn't know what it is yet. I don't know what it is yet. I don't think anyone knows what it is yet. You know, but there's there's an event horizon that you're afraid of looking over because it's terrifying. Who mm. knows what's on the other side? But I think it is right that you go there because it's only from leaving the paradigm because like like. Uh, Sorry, I know I'm going on a lot, but like AA was talking a while no, ago no, absolutely. about the concept of meritocracy, right? And he was like, ah, this is like the last liberal canard that I can't break. And it's like, no, you can't, right? Because it, And it is. It is like, it, it is the, the most secure pillar of liberalism is the idea that someone who's worthy should be given something, right? And, it's, and that's hard. That's, it, that's genuinely a hard thing to attack. And he was talking about this the other day, and I saw him post a list of things where I was like, well, there are these other things that aren't meritocratic. And he had this long list of things, but really out of that list, I think there was only one thing that was true, that was truly anti-meritocratic, and that was birthright. That was, you are because you are. You know, there is no, no competition. Like, it, when talking no. about things like class and sex, like, you're talking about multiple people, and so there is a door opening there for meritocracy. It's like, well, why not, you know, why not that aristocrat and that aristocrat? It's like, well, because we're talking about the, the genuine, like the prince, you know, the, the firstborn son of the king, you know, there is no merit meritocratic consideration here. It is that person. It's a mythological. This is, you know, written in the stars, as it were. Um, and that, that's, that's the only truly anti-meritocratic thing I think he'd listed. And it's, and I'm, I'm not even saying I'm in favor of any of this. I don't want anyone to mistake any of what I'm saying for an endorsement, but it's, I think it's a true analysis that this is what the, the dissident right is looking at. And it's like, okay, so are, you know, is this, this going actually out of liberalism now and truly beyond this event horizon, what is it you think you're looking at? And it's actually like, okay, nobody really knows, right? And nobody, nobody really has the, the guts to be like, can we actually commit to this? I mean, is that something that could be committed to? Because then you have all questions of legitimacy that follow from that. Anti-meritocracy, you mean? Uh, yeah, after meritocracy. It's like, where does legitimacy come from? And well. All these other questions. Uh, and so it's, it's, and I'm not saying I have the answers either. No, I'm no. just saying, like, I can see the event horizon that the DR is standing on. And I'm curious as to what, it's going to see. Over I, I feel like I know what the event horizon is, but I'm going to save that for later and just yeah. address the, the most proximate point. The issue with meritocracy from a classic point of view is not sort of it's the idea that you should be elevated for merit or for virtue. I think that's pretty constant throughout culture. I think the idea of meritocracy, and this really comes down to us from a Puritan point of view, uh, which you could just say American and it would translate to the same thing in European speak. Uh, well, uh, an idea, a thread of ideas that's best represented in America and only secondarily in England. This is the idea that you like pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you're a self-made man. And there's this expression that a lot of people on the distant right say, or they have, uh, that the woke is more correct than the mainstream. And, and that is, this is not obviously in a moral sense, but this is the idea that the woke are reacting to a certain problem inside of liberalism that the mainstream has to ignore in order to uh, mm -hmm. continue on with, with sort of its own political formulas, its own mm -hmm. its political formulas just via R.N. McIntyre, via Mosca. It's just well, an excuse for power, basically, can right? I, can I give you yeah. an example of that? Because uh, they, like, the... What what you what you're saying there about bootstraps? I would call that the sort of Protestant view, right? The sort of Northern European Protestant view. Mm -hmm. And you are right uh, to say the distant right is right to say that the woke are more right about certain things than the Protestant worldview. As mm -hmm. in the, I mean, the state of the black community at the moment. There, I don't think there are any amount of bootstraps that are going to pull that up. No. And so the the woke are right when they say, well, look, we have to pull these people up, or else they won't that's a true statement you know and so i'm not saying they're going about it in the right way or anything like that but you know to expect this community to fix itself i you know. yeah 
I mean, it, it, that's absolutely the case. And uh, the, the it's sort of funny because I was, um, I, I don't know if you know this individual, I'm kind of friends with this individual, but I couldn't imagine someone I disagree with more. Uh, this is Thinking Ape or Stardusk. Uh, yes, and yeah. and he, I really disagree with him. And I was actually listened to his videos and he's like a horrible, <laughs> he's very black pilled. And yes. he had a video that was an attack on meritocracy asserting that most things we do uh, are our luck. And most of the stuff we have is, is the product of circumstance. And I actually don't necessarily agree with that, uh, that, that we, we can, we can in this life never really know what we have that is the product of our own virtue. But this only kind of obscures the question because as long as there is a single thing we can possibly do, it, it, as long as we're not complete automata to the, to the wills of the norms or, or the threads of fate, as long as we aren't just 100% puppets, then there are actions we can take in our own life that can be virtuous or that can be evil. And, and from that thread, we can pull, we can resurrect a notion of, of what Aristotle would, would consider to be, or what people would later call a virtue ethics or Aristotelian ethics. And I think, so, so I'm not so sure, you know, this is, this is one of those things where the, the criticism isn't so much focused the criticism has to do with a, a very modern problem, a very modern version of the problem that's 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 come into focus after the 20th century. I'm not so sure the critique is necessarily as deadly to the mainstay of human thought, qua human thought. Hmm. So I, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I'm very much a believer in personal agency, and I think that my own life is a good example of that. Actually, uh, all of the things I have are simply because I essentially willed them into existence. You know, I, I made, I just did it and made it happen. And luckily things also fell into place. And so mm -hmm. it has made things that are pretty good for me and hopefully for others. So I, I totally agree with you on this. And I, th I think there's, um, I think there's a conflation of perspectives here that's going on because on the narrow perspective of you personally in your own life, obviously agency is everything you know you are completely or almost everything you are completely in control of those things that you do and that affects the scenario around you whatever's happening and so you become uh and and uh, this is something that being a parent has taught me like being the rule setter for a household is a very empowering position you know and suddenly you realize like mm. actually i'm the judge and jury and executioner of these rules and so now it teaches you a lot about I mean, your, your son's, what, three, is it? So when, when he gets yeah, to about seven... More closer to two, but yes. Yeah. Sorry, closer to two. When, when he gets to about seven and realizes what lying is, and then when you have two children, and then <laughs> one of them is lying, and you need to figure out which one, and they're both... <laughs> and uh, you really start getting a broader perspective on the concept of justice. But systemically, the more, the more wider thing, I do think that it is not wrong for people to say, look, things are spiraling out of control and yeah. the the train that we're on is clearly getting to its destination at this point uh things are going to get bad and we actually don't physically have the power to stop those that is true so essentially i think that make provisions for your personal life now as best you can don't think that you can somehow change the course of the tiger yeah, i think you just have to ride it actually yeah at this point. Well, this is academic agents thing, and I don't, I wouldn't say academic agent or my friend Charlemagne are purity spiral, but I would say that they're they're quite a bit they're they're quite a bit spicier than I typically am, and and their yeah. um their their statements publicly, and I think academic agent is correct when he says that the dissident right has only one unifying concept, and that's clear at the mouth. Uh, there's this there's this desire. The, the only thing that unifies the dissent right is this idea that there needs to be a, a hard reset to the, the, the path that we're on. And the only way to do this is to kind of jolt the system. Uh, this is something that I think a lot of times has come under fire under the name accelerationism, which I don't support. I'm a pacifist, but it, it is, it is a, it, I share their sentiment that there needs to be a jolt uh, or, or some kind of hard break with the path that we're on, because especially post COVID, it's it, it's hard to see any of these systems writing themselves. They're they're completely out of control. So we're either going to watch as they tear into their own credibility, or I don't know what's going to happen. 
uh, it doesn't seem like anything that the right can construct is really a, a worthy rival of, of these powerful institutions that we're staring down right now. So I think that the progression of critical race theory has been a very instructive lesson. And I wrote a piece about this called How Elites Are Captured on LotusEaters.com uh, mm. because it's very interesting going back to the origin point of critical race theory. Uh, I mean, the, the sort of, and the proto movements that spawned it in the late 70s, 80s, 90s to now. And you can see that these people felt like the dissident right. They felt mm -hmm. like you right now. Uh, and they, they looked at the liberal hegemony in the concept of civil rights and realized that they had nowhere to go unless they did a Hannibal. They either found a way or made one. And so they made one. And you can tell that this is the work of many hands over many years. And people say, yeah, well, they were in elite institutions. Yeah, they were. They were. But I think that what they were operating in is in the pre 21st century paradigm. And so that's where they had to be. Uh, you guys are operating on YouTube. This is the <laughs> same as far as they're concerned. Yeah, they were in your university. Well, you're on their platform, you know, and it's the same mm -hmm. sort of thing. You are also in the same space, but as a very tiny siloed interest group. And it is from this that they spent a lot of time coming up with the first thing was their positive vision. Right. And their positive vision mm -hmm. was quite milky, quite you know difficult to to really see. But they had a, you know, we're being oppressed and, and we can have a better world if these shackles were thrown off of us. Okay. And so then they ended up having to craft a kind of weapon, a kind of ideological weapon. I think this is the real problem for the dissent right. Because essentially what the dissent right needs to be able to make is a sentence in which when it's said, it is undeniably true, it pathologizes your enemies to be cons something morally akin to Nazis mm -hmm. and it renders you pure and virtuous in all circumstances without question. Now that is a very difficult thing to craft. The, the critical race theorists took 30 years to craft this, but they did it. And out of this oh. is where we get intersectionality. Sorry. What was the sentence? You're racist. <laughs> Well, essentially, yes. <laughs> essentially, yes. Um, so <laughs> well, actually, I want to pause here because there's two interesting th threads here, right? Because mm -hmm. um, there's critical race theory and then there's intersectionality. Uh, and there is this idea of a positive vision. F first of all, uh, you know, I would say that our situation as citizen right is way less strategically placed than theirs. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, our enemies are hyper aware of us. Uh, mm -hmm. We are not in institutions that have stipends. Uh, we don't have friends among establishmentarians the way that critical race theory did. And we don't have something like civil rights law on our side. There's other, the other obstacle is that most people on the right, we're not looking to tear down a system. We're looking to create one. We want to have order. So the operation we're trying to do is to sort of push the cart up the hill. Uh, uh, sorry to interrupt yeah, you. Uh, now, the, this is a common misconception, I think, that the distant right has of the critical race theorists. Uh, you view yourselves as outside of liberalism, and you view yourselves uh, as not having any elite allies, and you view yourselves in an intractable position. But the thing is, this is all true about the critical race theorists themselves. Like, the first hurdle they had to overcome was liberal views on civil rights. And so mm -hmm. what they had to do is essentially, like, uh, like a chameleon, is insert themselves into it. And so... They knew that they weren't liberals. They knew they didn't believe the liberal view on civil rights. And yet they went into it and pushed it open and broke it apart. That's what I think the dissident right has to do. Well, they, they, they did that using equivocation and weird language games that implied Very, that they... I, that, see, I fundamentally do not think that the right wing can sort of equivocate its way to victory. I think that clear language has to be our ally. Like just language that just kind of lays it bare. Like, I mean, meme magic is actually closer to what we need than equivocation because the, the, the idea of meme magic is that the fundamental right wing observations are just so sort of so primal and obvious mm -hmm. that they can just be communicated in like, here it is, whereas left wing well, need like a, they need a wall of text to justify That's the joke their, of it. You, yeah. you, the, the right's memes are speaking to a truth. 
whereas the left's memes are a constructed hyper reality. Um, yeah. But the but if you deliberately place yourself outside of the mainstream, then you are disadvantaged to the point where I don't see how an entryway is possible because of how you said the enemies are hyper aware of you right they're hyper aware of what you are and what they're trying to do because yeah. they because they did they did it they did, <laughs> they did, they did it. exactly yeah, it exactly. and so they're looking out for you and that's that's mm -hmm. what I, i've called it the double-edged narrative this it creates the moral community and the immoral community in the same sentence and it cuts through to the person where they've, they've they're on the point of a sword and it's like right choose and it's like well i've got to choose the moral community obviously you know mm -hmm. or else you're going to stab me it's like well okay and now you need your uh, your angle of attack now and i'm not saying it, it, i know what that's going to be you know but that is something that you need you need this kind of rhetorical attack because people have got to remember we didn't end up here because of a violent revolution like no physical damage was required to get to the point where billions of dollars are being given to black lives matter no no, no i mean that's you know there is violence obviously but that wasn't how it became powerful that's a yeah. consequence of them being in power uh, and so it's it's all argument and it's been done because of the intrinsic weaknesses of the current ideological order and the critical race theorists were just smart enough to see the the weak point and psh, hit it and boom suddenly they're through and now we've got to accept all of their premises or else you're a racist you're a bigot you're trans blah, blah, blah. it was and very obvious in the 90s that the, the 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 cultural crown of western civilization was in the dirt and the yes. progressives picked, picked it up with a sword but to get on to my next thing, uh, intersectionality is not a positive vision. Intersectionality is uh, clear them out for the left. Uh, it, it literally is the same thing as what academic agent is saying. Uh, yes. Intersectionality says that you know Muslims and and like homosexual rights activists are part of this giant coalition against white straight but, christian america that's that's the i mean that's the i mean i know you can dress it up but that's basically the core of it the core is like the political coalition of everyone who has something to gain if the the the, the previous western order was swapped away and then reorganized but they do have a positive vision that underpins all of this and that is the vision of total personal freedom uh no matter yes. what it is okay that's that, true that that's the positive vision that unites them all you know, as in this, this is why the gay activist who wants to drink gallons of piss is on the same side as the abortionist, is on the same side of the Black Lives Matter looter, as the same side of the drug addict in San Francisco. You know, all of this is, right, I just want total personal freedom and I don't want the straight white male heteropatriarchy telling me that actually maybe a bit of self-restraint is a good thing, right? That's the, that's the moral vision. That's sort no of the Foucaultian perspective, right? I, yes. I don't want to be superimposing... I don't think Foucault ever said that in so many words, but that's oftentimes what's implied by his writings. When you and, say that prison is a form of oppression, then yeah, that pretty much is. Yeah, I mean, the prison is obviously Foucault's big bad and total personal freedom would be his big good. I'm, I'm making it incredibly crude here, but that's sure. what, you know, I, I would just question how many, uh, how much of the leftists coalition is actually composed of people who embrace this vision of total personal freedom in its absolute form. I would say that that, that coalition is fairly, that, that group of people is fairly small. About 8% of the population are progressive activists. Mm. Uh, and so I think uh, the polling shows this. And about 8% or 10% of the population are like hyper-conservative people who you would consider, say, democratic, uh, democratic dissident right. Like it's, it's, we, we, we went through these stats recently, actually. It's, it's a mm. roughly even number of people who are what we'll call the radicals on the other side. But, yeah. um, but the problem is that the, the progressive activists, the, the, and these are the people who have got the shout your abortion t-shirts and you know the, the genuine worst of the worst, uh, they've got a very powerful moral weapon that they are deploying constantly. And the right is just being completely whipped by this. And so essentially the right has to come up with a moral weapon that is going to show the value of structure and order and self-control right that, mm -hmm. and that's that's what you are essentially i think that's the the core moral vision of the right comes from the moral benefits of order you know why yes. why it's good that things aren't 
chaos, whereas the left are the pro chaos activists. Uh, so I know they is, are. They they genuinely. No, I, 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 I absolutely agree. Yeah. This is the the famous the famous Yarvin quote. Yarvin reacted to the Dungeons and Dragons alignment system of you know good evil and chaos oh, yeah. neutral. He said, "This is stupid. Dungeons and Dragons one is is better. There is no such thing as chaotic." good and there's no such thing as lawful evil there's just order and chaos and chaos mm -hmm. is bad and order is good and you know everyone he said this this essentially obliterates the um the 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 most popular alignment chaotic good but here i'll give you an example I, he didn't say this but i i when you look at han solo, solo who's your classic example of a chaotic good character uh he, he he's he's lovable because you know that his ordered side is going to win out over his chaotic side if han solo continues to be chaotic as as a father and as a ruler the same way he was as a bount as a smuggler uh then his personal chaos will will become an existential chaos very quickly mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of implied in sort of the horrible sequel series right well, where, no, where you, have his, you have his fails and literally like becoming the new darth vader <laughs> Well, I think you're completely correct on that. Like the, like Han Solo's entire career is pre, like presupposes that there will be an order for him to subvert, to profit off of, right? Mm. And like you say, you know, when it when when the when the final calculation is being made, his ordered side, his lawful side, will come to the fore, and that's what makes him a hero. You know, that's what makes him one of the good guys. Uh, whereas you know the the people who go for the willful chaos are obviously the villains. Mm. So. Um, but I, like I said, I haven't got the answers or anything like that, but I can just see the lay of the land and I can, I can see what you guys are missing that they have. And they have a very powerful weapon for chaos. Uh, and you do not have a very powerful weapon for order. Uh, however, you know, the worse things get, the more strong your weapon of order will become. And so, like, I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I'm not an accelerationist, but it's become obvious to me that you guys have got to just allow yourself to be flayed. You've got to watch as the world gets worse, and you've got to understand what you are offering instead. What is the genuine beating heart of your movement that you yes, can open absolutely. up and show people and say, look, this is better. You know, this is good. That's evil, and I can prove it. You know, and I, like I said, I haven't got all the answers, but this is, I can see this. You know, I can see it. Well, I know before we came on the stream, we were talking about Friedrich Nietzsche and mm. uh, this, I don't know if I should bring this individual up, but this is sort of where I'm thinking more and more. Uh, the, the, answer, the answer to the situation we're in, the left is going to burn itself out. That, that's the ultimate fate. And they're going to take out an enormous amount of what we previously called our civilization. And they're going to trigger some kind of foundational reset. Now, the person I submit to you that that it has truly kind of grasped the nettle of the situation that we're in, I, it pains me to say this as a Christian, but the person who spiritually is the most aware of where we are, not where we should be, is probably the blogger known as Bronze Age Pervert. Are you aware of this individual? I am aware from academic agents' various postings about him. I've never read his blog. But I okay. knew you were going to say Bronze Age Perva. I knew you were going to say it. I, it pains me as a Christian because he is yeah. quite anti-Christian. He has set himself up as an opponent of mm -hmm. uh, of traditional morality, which is my main thing. Uh, I always hate to say traditional morality because people think I'm some kind of trad Catholic. I'm just a standard issue Catholic. I'm, you know, I I, I go to vernacular mass. Uh, although I, do I hate the them. Pope. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Pope. This is a weaker pope than uh i think it's very uh, generous yeah it's a weaker very pope generous. um uh people will remember that the the last pope that was put into power uh by a, a resignation was literally the pope that uh dante alighieri uh was was raging against uh in his own uh divine comedy he didn't put him in hell because he wasn't dead yet but it's pope boniface right right pope boniface was the last pope to be put into position by the resignation of pope celestine also saint celestine uh, which Dante hated Boniface so much that he sent Celestine to hell, even though the Catholic Church thinks he was a saint. But uh, I'm sorry, Boniface was a weak pope, and Dante hated him for it. And and it seems that we may have a analogous situation right now. But I cannot comment on that as a Catholic. You, surely yeah. the next the next pope isn't going to be like another Innocent the Third, though, right? Uh, I mean, that's what you need. 
Well, that's what I, you need. I, I don't you know, need, you know? need a firebrand. <laughs> Come on. You need someone who could be like, actually, no, this is all wrong. And you know yeah. it's all wrong because I've got a book about it called the fucking Bible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you, you've seen the, the Jude Laws, the young pope, or at least his. I haven't. His actually, no. Oh, but you've seen the monologue where he's. Uh, he, Jude Law is no, plays no. this. Okay, well, you should, I should send you this to. It, he plays this reactionary pope that comes on the heels of someone like. And he just. He gives this speech where he's like. I'm going to take this church back to the Middle Ages. And I'm going to, like, anyone who isn't pure and willing to, like, come to us is going to get kicked out because we are the church and we are rock and we're not moving. <laughs> and, I mean, that's uh, what you need. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, it's, and Jude Law just nails this thing. So, but, yeah. but anyway, okay. um, back to Bronze Age Pervert. He, he's anti Christian and he has a lot of takes that I think are just the wrong direction in terms. But he, he understands that the only way out of this is to sort of uh, hit a reset in your own mind and return to sort of basic reality. Mm. Oh, well, everyone kind of gets sucked into the metaverse and just be the only people who show up to reality when everyone else is completely uh, out, out to lunch or, or in their own simulations or, or, or basically high on their own ideological supply, which it seems that everyone is. People on the right complain a lot about the World Economic Forum and these kind of supervillain characters like Klaus Schwab. And that, don't get me wrong, I think they're going to do a lot of evil. But I think that they are totally high on their own supply. I think that they, uh, they, they, they are not in control of the situation. They, their job is to convince the world leaders that they are in charge of the situation, that they can promise them a future world that's not going to exist. And so I think Bronze Age Pervert and Bronze Age Pervert is attempting to be like the modern Nietzsche mm -hmm. with, 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 with allusions to like this whole grug brain, like he intentionally uses poor grammar in his, uh, in his magnum opus, the Bronze Age mindset. He deliberately makes English mistakes. And, um, and because of this, I think this is, uh, this is, um, th this is the only, the only way for the right is to kind of hit this uh, reset in your own personality where you're like, all right, you know, we've lost the metapolitical game. We may have even lost the, the larger war from Western civilization. But in our circles, something real is happening. And, and everything else everyone's doing outside of this is just fake. Mm. Yeah, we, we may have lost, but we're not dead. And That's, everyone else is dead, right? Yeah, well, yeah, they're zombies. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're walking, but look at them you know they're not they're not capable of, and th this this brings us to culture actually which i think is a useful indicator here i mean look yeah. at what western culture fucking produces now just exactly. jesus christ it is embarrassing to be a part of the west and see hollywood producing here's another reboot of some and there's oh, i could go on for hours about how they're they're just the worst things in the world but what i find really interesting is that it's not even that they they're bad it's like there's something aesthetically defective about everything mm. they do and i've i've been looking at it like i i had to watch my, my wife's a big fan of resident evil right the video games <laughs> oh really and, yeah yeah, yeah. The, the actual you know the the original video games <laughs> and the the first couple of movies she really liked them right she's a big fan of them right okay fine and so new series comes out oh we have to watch this I'm like, okay, <laughs> go on then and it's so bad she was like i hate this this isn't resident evil this is shit and i'm like yeah i know let's keep watching though because right? I'm enjoying just how shit it is. And yeah. one thing that I've noticed about like everything, and you see this in like the modern Star Wars and everything, right? Mm -hmm. There's a there's a kind of quality that the people on the screen have that you don't find in previous eras because the people in previous eras were made in a different way, right? Look they at were. how look at how soft skinned all of these people are. Look at how like round their features are. You know? Mm -hmm. Look at how like the the way they try and set their jaws when they're trying to give you an impression of an emotion shows you they've never really experienced true hardship true loss true confrontation right these are the these are the products of like the helicopter parenting and the excessive uh hr departments where no one can have a problem they have to solve themselves and so you it's and this managed. this this drips off of them to me, you know, I'm looking at these like, you know, 23 year old actresses or whatever, and they just look 
like children. Whereas if you go back and watch the say like the original Star Wars, Han Solo looks like an adult man. You know, he's yeah. he, you know, he it's it's a different time and it's different people and you can see the softness in everything they produce. And so there's this layer of inauthenticity about everything. You know, all of the all of the way they try to portray a genuine human emotion that you know they've never really had. And so they don't know how to try and fool you into thinking. There's no verisimilitude to any of it. And and that's the thing, you know, on top of all the shit writing and the lack of understanding of what a story is meant to be, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's this, like, core of dead, inauthentic matter that lays at the heart of the Western cultural project at the moment. And it's because the people involved are all technicians right there's not a single artist left not what because an artist is someone who has gone through some hard human event and has come out the other side and gone oh my god i need to try and explain this to people i need to yeah. try and explain to them what just happened to me and i've got you know the the clay the the, the you know, whatever i'm going to work into this wild piece of art that you're not going to understand but you're going to stare at for hours trying to figure out what i've put into it and the things i don't even know what I'm going to end up doing, you know, when I'm, but I'm going to put myself into this. Those people are gone, man. Um, did, yeah. I take you watch Ma Matrix Resurrections, right? I the haven't. latest one. I haven't. I've watch watched it. reviewed. Oh, no, no. Watch it. It's not a story. It's a confession, right? <laughs> I, I, did a, I did a big breakdown on it on lotusseast.com, actually, because it, this, this was so perfect, right? The entire film is Lana Wachowski's admission that every artist has died and she is mm. essentially like the last artist and this is her confession of the end of her career and her profession as an artist because she in it right so the the, the framing of it is that neo is actually uh, a video game designer um and he so he's 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 made something called the matrix which is the you know the, a video game of the film you know so it's slightly different but it's basically mm. he's made the matrix and now the, the production company literally wants them to make another Matrix. And you can tell this is just a facsimile for Lana Wachowski's own life. Yeah. And she's like, yeah, but I can't. And it's like, okay, well, why not? And so they sh she shows you the production process. And you can see that, oh, my God, this is exactly what they do every day, right? And so you've got mm -hmm. this very diverse, like, you know, there's like a dozen or so, uh, you know, f like, I don't know, people who are chipping in ideas, right? But what they're doing is they're essentially analyzing that which already exists, uh, uh, someone else's artistic vision. And they're going, oh, what is the Matrix really about? As if they can extract a theory from studying the Matrix enough and then create yeah. something artistic from that. It's like, no, 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 no. You, you are on the wrong side of this. You know, the artist is way over here. You know, the generative engine that doesn't really understand what it's trying to put out, that is taking a big risk when it creates its art, right? You guys and you, the, 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 the terrain they're in is the, the most important thing. Like Neo's life, he gets up in his air conditioned apartment. It's a beautiful apartment. He looks out of the window and sees glass steel towers. He gets in an elevator, gets his coffee, goes and sits down with this focus group. They theorize about the Matrix. And then he just goes to the gym and then goes back to his bed in a glass tower. And that's every single day. That's the stimulus that he gets. That's his intellectual stimulus. And so everything that he sees, all that comes through the, the black screen on his phone, you know, the, the reflective screen on his phone, he's just looking at his phone. That's, that's his window to experience. Like, and that's what the problem is. You know, and this is again, Lana, I don't know whether she knew she was doing this, but you can, it's these people need to go out and have challenges, but they can't, they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're essentially trapped in these giant cities without understanding the value of not actually having everything at hand. And so the kind of people who are making all of these things, again, it might be Hollywood being a victim of its own success here. You know, it's like, okay, you've created this giant edifice, but now it's like, I mean, it's kind of rotting from within and it kind of reminds me, it kind of reminds me, you know, Jean, uh, Jean Baudelard, the, he was the philosopher that uh, a lot of the Matrix was based around. And he was, <coughs> you know, he, he criticized the Matrix because he said that the, the point of his simulacra and simulacrum was that it would never be clear whether you were out of the Matrix. And yeah. the, um, the, the, the the he also gave a scathing review saying that the matrix was the kind of movie that the matrix would make about itself uh yes. which is kind of like I, I think in hindsight was probably you could have just i wish that i wish i had read that when i had just seen the matrix in 1999 
but that that I think that will be the epitaph of that entire franchise. And, uh, and sorry, sorry to just jump in. Yeah. I was aware of that as well, and it was only after watching Matrix Resurrections that I understood what he meant by that. You know, because mm. then like it, because it's so like mask off where they're like, right, it's a film about the Matrix trying to make the Matrix in the Matrix or you know about the Matrix, and you can see exactly what he's saying when he says that. But sorry, carry on. No, it's it's um. It's, uh, yeah, I, I guess th there's another movie that I kind of wanted to bring up. And well, I, I should say first that what we're seeing right now is kind of, there was this whole irony culture in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And then this was, this was pointed out very famously by the writer David Foster Wallace, among other people. And what, what happened was people tried to get back to sincerity, uh, but, but something went wrong on the entire equation. Something went wrong and we got, we didn't really get sincerity. We got these very, very effeminate confessions or mm. these performances of sincerity that didn't really feel authentic. And it felt sort of like we were executing, we were trying to execute. They, they knew that irony, like a completely ironic culture, like you see in Seinfeld, people were beginning to criticize that, but we couldn't really escape it because we never got to sincerity. We got to performances <clears throat> of sincerity and the problem, uh, and this is what I keep on coming back to, the difficulty is the, the question of belief. Like, what do we believe in? Mm. There, there's this movie, I know you haven't seen this, and it's a shame you haven't, but uh, there, this is, I would say that the problem's more visible in good movies than it is in bad ones. I saw a movie called The Northman. I'm sure you've heard it. Um, I'm going to try to talk about it without giving you spoilers. But it's in, okay. I've, I've actually got a terrible memory for films. Okay. And, and so e e even if I do go to watch it, I will not have remembered the spoiler when I get to watch it. So go ahead. Go so ahead. It, it, it's, it's basically Viking Hamlet, but it, it, it portrays Vikings in a brutally realistic way. Uh, in some ways, they sort of detract from the, in some ways, the brutality detracts from the narrative scheme of the, uh, of the movie because it helps prevents you from sympathizing with anybody, but that's mm -hmm. immaterial. The, the, the central dilemma that the hero faces is uh, the, the question of how far to pursue vengeance against basically members of his own family many years mm -hmm. after the original crime has occurred. And of course, there is there is a, a love interest too with that really strange looking actress Anya, Anya what's her face, uh, literally. <laughs> um, I, I I, I know the actress mainly because of the large space between her eyes, but um, <laughs> uh, the oh Anya Taylor, yes yes I know um, who you're talking yeah. about. I had to just and, look it up there. Yeah. Uh, the the um, I, I remember I you know I remember walking out of the movie and it was it's a very well made movie it's very competently made and it I think I who knows what's realistic when it comes to mm. night, you know 10th century Vikings but but I didn't feel at any moment that I was seeing something that couldn't happen in the 10th century in Iceland or Norway. And, but the problem is I walked out of the theater and I asked like the, the difficulty here is um, what, what did the directors believe? I mean, it would be the directors don't believe in true love between a man and woman. They don't believe that it's it's very, very important to continue your line. And they also don't believe in in sort of heroic masculine uh, ability to stand up to other people in terms of, of like you're, you're in the right and you need to like take vengeance, you need to put the world right. Uh, these things, um, they're viewing these concepts like family loyalty and true love and masculinity and, and I, machismo is the wrong world, but whatever the Viking equivalent of that is. Uh, they're viewing these emotions like they're animals in a zoo, not as experiencers of them. Mm. And, and, and this, this is very, I, I felt at least, and maybe I, you can confirm this when you watch the movie, I felt that the, the actors, even though the form of the movie was perfect, the actor's detachment from these emotions and it was was very much on display. I did not feel like I was, I didn't feel as an audience member that I had to grapple in my own soul whether loyalty to love was more important than than the pursuit of a just cause. I felt like I was just watching, like an alien would watch those two emotions. Like I under, I've been told from yeah. the, the pedigree of humans that humans are an animal in which uh, love of your woman has to come into conflict with, 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 with righteous vengeance you have as a man. Like I read that on the package called <clears throat> human and now I'm seeing it on the screen, but like, I don't experience these emotions. I, I never had this happen to me. It, this is just what's happening. And this is, this is the problem with all modern movies is that there is a, there's a problem of fundamental belief 
I, I will. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, 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 just I, no, no. I think you're exactly hitting on the point that I was trying to make with Adam and Sitch about Star Wars. Uh, actually, on that stream, is that what what you are what you're seeing is the product of very competent technicians, right? Mm -hmm. Like they 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 have been given a schematic and they have been given essentially all the resources they need, and they have produced a very fine imitation of a thing. Whereas if you think back to like George Lucas making Star Wars, he had a vision, he knew mm. what he was trying to do, but he was very limited, you know, like uh, CGI wasn't something that existed. And so everything had to be done by hand. And he had strong time constraints because he wasn't like George Lucas at that point. He was just some guy, right? Mm. And it's like, okay, well, go on, see if it's any good. And so you, you, you know, art from adversity is very much a real thing, in my opinion. It's, you know, very, very important. And so there, there, had, there was this undercurrent of authenticity that underpinned it, right? Like, so when Luke Skywalker is, you know, like wistfully looking off into the desert, you feel it, right? He, he knew yeah. what he was trying to put across. There was a kind of sincerity there, wistful. The desire for adventure, right? Yes. That, the yeah, desire yeah, yeah, for yeah. adventure, it, it, like that's so primal, right? Yeah. And, and and people in the 80s, they believed in that, right? They also yeah, believed they in heroism. Like, but yeah. the, the Ray fans do not believe in adventure or in heroism. They... <laughs> They, they, just, they just don't, right? So even if the the director, I, I don't know, maybe even if the director, the director didn't believe in it, obviously, certainly the director of the second film didn't believe in it. I don't think J.J. Abrams believes in heroism. Um, but but the movies of the 80s, they actually believe it. Like the John Melius is Conan the Barbarian. Uh, in some ways it doesn't hold up, but the, the movie is carried forward by just the absolute belief. John Melius was a surfer. Right, he was he was famous as a surfer, and actually his daughter is really prominent. The just didn't write, which is also kind of funny. Um, she was part of the Trump administration. Uh, oh, really? But, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, I forget what her name. Amanda Malias, I think it is. Uh, she was part of the whole Vogue article about uh, that crowd. Um, right, right. And uh, John Malias was a surfer, and so his appreciation for raw masculinity uh, oozes out of every scene of Conan the Barbarian, and. Uh, and and it's and it is unescapable, and his belief in it's unescapable, and it played to an audience who uh, they they could see something like Conan the Barbarian and not look for like homosexual subtones, like they weren't trained mm -hmm. to do that, mm -hmm. and they weren't trained to sort of deconstruct the movie as it was going on. And I mean, th this applies to almost every '80s action movie, like '80s and early, like think like Predator or something like that. Yeah. You know, like there's a genuine belief in the power of masculinity, and that's actually subverted somewhat by the fact that the monster is too strong to merely overcome by being a strong man right and it's yeah you know if the, if even but the, you like you say there's a genuine belief in it you know that it's, mm -hmm. it's authentic and it's sincere and you are right the people who make anything now even if they're making it to pander to that sort of view don't believe it themselves and i think you've hit on that that is well, important it's funny, it's funny you mentioned predator because like there's a new predator movie coming out called prey and oh, yeah. uh, i um, didn't even know that I, well, okay, but like this movie is, um, it's like the concept's brilliant, right? Like the concept's brilliant. So the concept is like Native Americans versus Predator uh, oh. before Europeans, which is yeah. amazing because if you think about it, it's perfect uh, because obviously the Predator plays by rules and uh, he's never, so he, he, you know, in the, even in the original movie, he's not overcome by strength, but by essentially embracing the nature of the game that the Predator is playing. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger can overcome him, and that would be that would play out perfectly. It, it would play out just as well in a primitive culture as it would in a uh, in, in, in in a technological one. The, the concept's the same, and as a matter of fact, it plays out better in a primitive culture. But, but the problem is, think about how amazing it would be to look at the predator from the eyes of a hunter and gatherer who didn't even know what a gun was. Well, someone who thinks of it as a demon, as a I demon. Mean, oh it, my it, god, that's just the important part. Just thinking about it, like it enthralls my imagination. Yeah, I look at the trailer and it's like a feminist allegory. Oh, is <laughs> right? it? I, yeah. What, what's it? I'm, I'm going to look it up afterwards. But what's it it's called? It's called. I believe it's called Prey, and uh, uh, and uh, the the problem is, I've heard it's not. I've heard it's not good. Fucking hell! I'm but just it, looking. Sorry to swear. I'm just yeah. looking at the the thumbnail, right? You know what I was saying earlier about these molly coddled like generation Z or very young millennial children who look inauthentic in themselves mm -hmm. because they're very clearly the product of a very safe environment. Just the, the woman on the front doesn't look like she just yeah. doesn't look, doesn't look. So, so it's, 
I haven't seen the movie, but it's all about like, no. I want to be a brave and I'm a woman. They won't let me. And that's not an emotion. That, that yeah. would be an incredibly uncommon emotion. First of all, it's an incredibly uncommon emotion for most women. I mean, I don't know, maybe like surviving against a demon would be an incredibly common emotion for women. I'm sure that's like a, that's a very common instinct. Uh, but, but, but like wanting to become a girl boss in, in a society <laughs> that that's based around muscular strength is is not something that it's not something that would have historically happened very much outside of incredibly unusual circumstances and it, it's also not something that i think many women can genuinely think to themselves like that's something that i i i i i, I can i can kind of see myself as as being like i don't think that this is and so you have this brilliant concept and it's just ruined mm. it's just like you mm. know they're not going to execute this correctly I'm, I'm, sure I'm just watching the trailer as you talk, and you are, you're yeah. absolutely right. Like the, I mean, a the the girl just she doesn't ever look like she's been struck in the face. Like she's not. <laughs> yeah. She's not, no, no. But I mean it, right? Like you you have to have a certain roughness to your features, a sort of a angularity that like nature has Im imbued you with because of the harshness of your life, you know? Mm. And back in like the seventies, at least kids were getting beaten up in school, you know, yeah. at least, at least they had something where they had to have looked inside of themselves, grasped it. And, um, you know, like, like, no, right. I'm, I'm not submitting to the bullies. I don't care. You know, and it, it may be very, you know, middle-class or suburban bourgeois. Oh, you're being bullied. You're being shoved into a locker or being shoved into the toilet. Yeah. Mm. But there's still a form of suffering. Well, there's no way, way out. No one's going to come and help. So there's still something there, you know, that, that you understand. But I'm just looking at this and, like like you say, it's a fantastic concept. Because yeah. the, the Native Americans, like, A, you've got a very honor-based culture anyway. Yeah, exactly. And they view the world as mythical and mystical. And so now you've got this invisible demon. All it does is confirm the magic of the world to them. Exactly, fantastic. right. The, the honor of the predator merges perfectly with the honor of their tribe. Exactly. You know? right. And it, it, you know, if you're, if you're the, the leading brave in this tribe, you're going to personally go out and fight the predator and the predator is at least going to respect that. Yeah. But this, and I don't mean to sound mean about it, but this is not a female archetype. I could even see sort of the female being the last one standing out of circumstance. Sure. Uh, sort of, Maybe. sort of, in, in it, as long as it came about in sort of an organic way, like mm. the original alien. Uh, and yeah. the original yeah. alien, it, it, I think it, part of the magic is, and this is somewhat undone in the second one, but Ripley very much is not a girl boss character. It just mm. she's just the organic survivor, and 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 because of that, the, the the heroism kind of emerges from the circumstances and the emotion of survival rather than this aspirational thing. And that might have been undone by the whole, like a predator thing is obviously the aspirational elements very prominent. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is the problem we're seeing again and again with culture is that uh, I think people don't want to, I guess there's two possibilities. The first one is, there's probably both of these things. The first one is we're just so detached from real life that we can't have these emotions mm -hmm. because we don't have experience of them. The second possibility, and I actually, more recently, I've kind of gone in this direction more in my own thinking, uh, is that we don't want to see the genuine emotions portrayed because the genuine emotions would ha carry with them scary implications about our own society. And Go uh, on, go on. Well, okay, so here, here go, go, let me give you an example. So let's stick I'm with the Native American one, right? Yeah. So let's go back to the 1990s. I can think of like one, two really awesome Native American movies uh, in the 1990s. The first one was obviously Dances with Wolves, uh, which, you know, that's a little bit proto-social justice-y. But there was one that was certainly not proto-social justice-y, and that was Last of the Mohicans with uh, mm -hmm. Daniel Day-Lewis. Uh, you know, uh, uh, one that really... It's a very honorable but absolutely unromantic portrayal of Iroquois warfare in in the French Indian. Law. Do you guys call it the French Indian War in Britain, or do you call it the Seven Years' War? I forget. Um, uh, I would have to check, to be honest. Uh, I mean, I'm aware of it. I've never bothered doing a lot of reading about it. Um, yeah, I imagine they call it the French Iroquois War. I don't see why they wouldn't. Uh, well, I mean, it was it was fought between French, French. And I was told that the French and English fought other places than America. <laughs> we we well, know we it doubtless is the French, did. I yeah, mean, the French Indian did. War. It's the one right yeah, before no. the Revolution. Um, but anyway, like it's it's like the Last of the Mohicans is this brutal portrayal of Iroquois warfare. Oh uh, yeah, that's part of the Seven Years' War, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, no, it makes a lot more sense now. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah, yeah, right, yeah.
Um, yeah, and it's um, and and uh, the thing is, is that um, uh, if you if you if you sort of portray uh, these these natural uh, emotions, these natural elements of masculinity and femininity, uh, like it immediately leaps off the screen to you as from a different world, and it also immediately leaps off the screen to you as something that is deeply attractive. Another movie that comes to my mind. This was the last movie of its kind that was ever made. Master and Commander. Uh, like a brutally realistic portrayal of a sea battle in, I, I think that's one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, if you haven't seen it, absolutely do. I think, you know, I'm, I'm going to embarrass myself. I haven't seen it. I haven't uh, seen I've, master and commander. I, I, that's exactly I, every time, like literally dozens of people. And it's not that I'm not interested in watching it. It's just that I never remember to spend the, you know, to spare some time to watch it. But I, I swear to God, I will do because everyone keeps giving me that bloody reaction. So I have to go and watch it. Well, the, the, the problem is my the, the problem master of the commander is one or two words russell crowe people see oh, yeah. russell crowe's they see russell crowe's face on the movie and they think that you're going to get like gladiator in sea battle um yeah. where it's like you know gladiator is a fun movie but it's incredibly on sure. like uh, there was actually marcus aurelius and he did have a you know ass hat son called commodus who drove the emperor into the ground but uh believe it or not after commodus died he did not hide the hands of uh, gladiator and also after Commodus died uh, Rome did not become the United States of America um, which I think <laughs> which I think was the ending of the Russell Crowe movie or at least it was heavily implied right yeah <laughs> um, but 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 Master and Commander is a um, incredibly realistic portrayal of what it would be like to live for like 20 days on a Napoleonic uh, man of war uh, it, it run by British uh, discipline and it's an incredible, I don't think there's a single woman in that entire movie. Uh, there, there might be one in the background when they come to court in, in one scene. But, That's usually uh, how people pitch it to me as well. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but it's, 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 it's an amazing, it's an amazing slice of life. And the, it came out at the same time as Pirates of the Caribbean. But the problem is, is that when you watch that movie, um, a sort of question pops into your mind. And so uh, millennials have been taught to, when they see a historical piece of fiction, uh, they're asked to give, okay, what, what, what is our opinion of those people? Hmm. When you look at Master and Commander and when you come away from watching it, uh, the uncomfortable question that kind of sticks in your mind is, what would these people have thought of us? Hmm. And that is sort of what I, I think of when I, when I go back and watch Last of the Mohicans, and that's what I think about when I watch Master and Commander. And that is the emotion that Hollywood really, really does not want us to think about. That's the direction that Hollywood really, really does not want us to think about. And in it, there's a lot of uncomfortable questions and a lot of uncomfortable implications about the society where we live. And, and that's why I think that you know, you're, you're not going to see movies like that anymore, even though I think that they, they're really calling out to be made. I think that's a fascinating way of uh, approaching the subject as well, because it, it's hard to imagine the the coomeristic society that we have now daring to watch or embrace a movie that mm -hmm. allows the the lens to be shone back against us right like you were saying like you know to bring yourself so fully into the perspective of the character that's being portrayed that you can essentially empathize completely with their mindset so much that you would walk out of the cinema and look at yourself and go, what does that mean for me? You know, and yeah. I think the closest, the closest that film that's come to this seems to be Joker from 2019. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, exactly. And look at the reaction to that. They're terrified. Oh my. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is going to create incel murderers everywhere. Yeah. Like, and that's what you thought was going to happen. Was it? If we just take that lens and shine it on ourselves for just a moment, you know, and, they were freaking out and that's a great point that's a great point i'm gonna well, ruminate well, on this you know like like tale of two cities for instance that i think that's the only charles dickens i ever read never read in high school i feel ashamed to say that it's the only dickens i ever read but it the, the hero chooses to go to his death to save a friend uh and and the the the, the book only gets its power it only gets its gut punch if if you think, man, I wonder if I would be a good enough man to do that. Mm. If if this is if the, if the movie's conclusion is this is just a stupid thing people did in the 18th century because in the 18th century they cut people's heads off, uh, and aren't we glad we don't guillotine people anymore? 
you can't relate to that, right? You can't relate to that. Like, this is a stupid thing someone did because back in the 19th century, and back in well the early 19th century there well i guess it was the late 18th uh, it's somewhere in in the boundary um they, they were they were really stupid and they and they and they decapitated people that once you look at it like an alien and everyone's playing out a pantomime of stupid reactions you've kind of lost the thread right you can't you can't put yourself in that position there's no moral weight to it anymore there's no mm. moral punch see i've been thinking about this and there's this is interestingly one of the one of the things about uh, the refugees who appear to have arrived in where I live and who are <laughs> coming across here via boat. Right? I mean, it's no doubt there's a dangerous journey. And what I find interesting, and I don't know why it's this way of framing it, but they they seem like bearers of civilization. Right? Mm -hmm. They they have they seem to have a conscious understanding of themselves as a part of a civilizational continuum and so they themselves carry this on their shoulders and so that gives them a an aspect of seriousness that i think is just completely gone from westerners yeah westerners the, the, and it, like I, I haven't got any better way of describing it but just seriousness uh, um, purposefulness right mm -hmm. they, i'm here for a reason you know, I am here to uphold a certain way of doing things. And you, you see this in the multicultural communities. The Sikh community, the people in the Sikh community are probably more Sikh than the Sikhs back in India. You know, the, the Muslims are very Muslim. The Hindus are very Hindu. They, they clearly see themselves as bearers of civilization, bearers of culture, and they commit to this. You know, this is important to them. These are boundaries that they patrol. These are traditions that they uphold every single day you know whereas we in the west are like it, it's it's like the liquefaction of mm -hmm. what was here before like everyone wanders around in the ruins of a great civilization in england and doesn't seem to realize that there was a great civilization here i'm actually reminded very much of xenophon wandering past nineveh and the natives not knowing the name of the city like yeah. and so he comes to, he comes to the largest city on earth that's in ruins and he's just like who the hell city is this and the nation's like don't know the persians it's like no it's the assyrians it's the capital yeah. of the assyrian empire but it's been gone for 300 years and i kind of feel that that is exactly what's happening now you know so i mean the, the people who live there have been there forever basically you know it's the same people but at some point like a civilizational ending event happened and the memory of it just it washes away into history and so now and i feel very much we're in the same thing you wander around london there are all these people there who don't know anything about the giant buildings that are around them. Yeah. You know, they don't know anything about the civilization that made these buildings. And so when that civilization has receded into the, like, the, the mists of history and these things begin falling down because the people who upheld them are no longer there to uphold them, the people who have come after, who've, who've you know, recently arrived, it's like, I don't know, don't know the, the British? Don't know anything about that, you know. And, and I feel very much that we're in that place where the... The people who are the bearers of the civilization no longer live in London, right? The, the yeah. next census is going to be out in its most, you know, in, in the ethnic breakdowns. I think about a third of London now will be English people. And it's like, right, that's that's remarkable because those from, people who have heard that's generous, yeah, but that's that's going to be yeah, the case. Yeah, it's, it's a gen, it probably is a generous estimate. To be honest. I see someone like pushing back on the civilization bearers and immigrants. There are really two kinds of immigrants. The the first kind of the ones you're talking about that are they're they're, they're full of they're full of a mission, right? Like they have a mission for their own people, you know. Well, no, and, no, hang on, no, no, hang on. Sorry, I, I I I see where they're going. There, that's not what I'm getting at. That's not what I'm getting. At. I'm not saying that the that there are there are sort of like colonists who have come here, and there are some people like that, but that's not what I mean. Like on an individual level, this migrants probably come here to go right i'm going to get a job i'm going to earn like x amount of money send it home to the family and you know blah 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 but they it's in what they do themselves personally like they take their own lives seriously they take mm. the things that they do seriously you know it's this is what i mean when i say a sort of bearer of civilization as in you know no, it's i have to go to the mosque on friday because that's what a muslim has to do you know i have to you know go to whatever hindu temple i'm supposed to go to because that's what a hindu does you know you know, and and it's it's down to like the cultural thing. I have to go to a wedding because this is what is done. You know, and this is what I mean. Like, it's not about a conscious sort of ethno imperialism. It's an unconscious, but like 
seriousness about oneself and upholding what it is right to uphold. And in the West, we've lost this seriousness. You know, you can go back 100 years and we had it, but we don't have it now. It's almost more, but it may be better to put it as we've lost this groundedness. Yeah. Uh, you know, r- regardless of whether the, 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 the immigrants in question are deep believers in their own civilization or religious order, or whether they are purely mercenary, it is unquestionably true that people <laughs> in the third world are, on average, more grounded. This is, I think this is kind of, um, this is kind of, I think this Can will I, kind of fade away. I think the, I think the pod mentality will actually explode in the third world in short order, but the hmm. kind of antibodies that you see on display, when you say that the Sikhs are more Sikh in England than they are in Indi- India, what you're seeing is the prefiguration of antibodies that all peoples will develop and that all ethnicities that survive either uh, survive in their present form or survive as, as new um, what's the right word? Amalgamation sounds to, mm-hmm. sounds um, like I'm making a value statement, but emerges combinations of, of order ones. They will all emerge because they mm-hmm. take on board uh, an, an amount of groundedness and 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 sort of the mentality that you're describing and thinking about the Sikhs. It, yeah, I mean, like the the way I'm trying to put it across is in it's been lovely weather here recently, and a hundred years ago, it would have been expected of me as an Englishman to go and play cricket on the local green, right? And everyone would have done it. We'd have gone down there, been, you know, the, all the wives would have come out, the kids would have played, the men would have played cricket on the green, and that would have been an English civilizational thing that we bore together. You know, this is just something, it would be expected, it would be proper to do this. But it didn't even enter my head to do something like this, right? This, this is how liquidated our culture is at this point. Like, you know, no, no Englishman sat there and thought, right, you know, oh, I mean, just proper go and play cricket with everyone, isn't it? You know, get out in the sun. and Like, that's, that's the thing. Whereas, like, I see, like, Indian festivals here in, mm. in Swindon, in my town, right? Uh, and it's, you know, like, recently, they, they had, like, some Indian food festival. But all of the Indians turned out for it. Why? Because they consider themselves a bearer of culture, you know, the, of a civilization. They see it as important to be the thing that they want to see instantiated into the world. And we Westerners do not think that way at all. And that's bad, is what I'm getting at. Again, no, I'm not no, talking I'm, about like, I'm ethnic conquest or anything. <laughs> no, I, like, I, I, I actually, I, I, I think I'm on the same page here. The, the, well, I mean, in, in a sense though, right? Because one of the, one of the, the main, di- well, I guess we could argue about why this has happened, but in, in my mind, oh, the, the, main, the main driver of this is, is it is sort of a decline in in, in belief in, and in 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 religious belief at a sort of primordial level i think but but what what happened was over the course of the last 200 year 200 years religious belief was was slowly replaced with sort of secular and nationalist components and then later on sort of individualistic components and then in the 20th century, those nationalist and individualist components stopped working so well. And, you know, now you have a machine that has like huge gaps in it, it seems. The, the, the apparatus has kind of decayed away. I'm mildly skeptical of this um, because I don't see how religion got us to play cricket on the village green, right? right. Yeah. And I, I, I feel that, uh, you know, were the English any other kind of religion we would still have been playing cricket on the green 100 years ago uh so it, it it's not that you're wrong either right there's definitely th- that's a kind of substrate to a uh, regular communal life mm-hmm. um but uh, i was i was thinking about this a lot because um i went through a bunch of footage and i've been reading uh, i'll you know specifically speaking in the case of england um, I've been reading books from about 100 years ago written by foreigners about the English. And mm. one, one of the remarkable things is that 100 years ago, it was offensive to be different, right? You, every, and you see in all of the old footage, everyone's wearing exactly the same kind of suit. They're wearing the exact same kind of hats, unless you're from a different class. But, you know, mm. each class has its own kind of hat. Uh, and they, they, they don't like it when you dress differently and then you get to like the 80s and it's vogue to dress differently everyone's dressed differently and but but even then it's you know this sort of in the 70s and 80s there's a kind of hangover where like people still you know the you know 
when you see a picture of the street, there's still a general feel for the civilization yeah. you're in. And then you get to the 90s, and everyone's just wearing crap. Absolute crap. And that's what I grew up in, you know, obviously. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it's like shell suits and T-shirts. And, and there's no... Again, like the, the, the bearing of people who consider themselves to be a, a part of a civilization that others might judge has gone completely. You know, whereas if you look at like the, you know, London in the 20s, where you've got all of these very poor people in their suits in the middle of the day, you know, where they, they, they seem to be aware that foreigners are going to be judging them for what they are. And so, and, and they judge one another. And so, okay, well, hang on a second. You know, our collective bearing has to be a little bit more proper because otherwise people are going to think ill of us. And that's, that won't do, will it? Whereas come the 90s, Nobody understands that that's bad. You know, the, the idea that, I mean, if they are a representation of a civilization, it's not a very impressive one. It doesn't no. produce very impressive people, you know, very serious people who take anything with any degree of, like, you know, proper forbearance. And it's, it's actually kind of embarrassing when you look back and you think, God, what, was, what were we doing? You know, actually, you are right. You know, it is wrong that everyone just fails to take into account you know other people's opinions or like what we all should be doing because you know we were a civilization and now we're not and it's no wonder it's so easy for foreigners to come up here and set up their own you know their own institutions well why not we haven't got any of our own have we it's like no we don't no. We've, got, we've got nothing anymore you know and i think you know i i, I want to make clear to the chat and to you i'm not saying that religion instituted these things like the pope declared that English people should play cricket. But what I'm saying is that the society is built on certain substructures of morality and teleology. Teleology being like the idea that something is for something else or some greater good. And uh, it, the, the community cannot come into existence without a teleology. And if you try to suppress it, it pops up in other dimensions. And what you see is, is over the course of the 20th century, Westerners lose their any explicit form of teleology, and it, it remains completely in the background. And then in the early, well, really since the Great Awakening, what has in fact happened is that, is that the, the progressive movement itself has become a kind of Gnostic religion mm -hmm. and, and has taken to absolutely basically completely destroying the, the old communitarian order around it and and that's really what we're seeing with with the wokeness of in, in my opinion I, th and, I think i sorry to interrupt i think i think i think we're, we're hitting on it here this is this is like fukuyama and you know i think just the the very phrase the term that have his famous uh, the end of history uh, i think that that is exactly right what i'm trying to say the the immigrants who've come here do not view themselves as being outside of history yeah. whereas the the western individual believes himself to not really exist in a time or a place you know he he just is and so he he's not connected to the sort of like cultural river through time and space yes. that the rest of their civilization is connected to that they understand themselves as being a part of we view ourselves as being outside of history and that's that's exactly the problem Exactly yeah, the yeah, but, well, again, like the, the problem is this is very complicated to parse out. Mm -hmm. But but the way I see it, there's this kind of like this base nihilistic hedonism. When you're a teenager, you can be like this total nihilist hedonist, and that's good enough for you, right? Mm -hmm. But then when the millennials started entering into their late twenties and thirties, and now the older millennials are like myself, we're staring at forty, and and you know a, a lot of well, I'm going to say women in particular, but you know, men too. They don't have families, right? Yeah. And 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 so when 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 I see this George Floyd stuff, and so many of my progressive friends just lost their shit as as a progress as a in, in sort of a religious furor over this. The, what I see is okay. So hedonistic, ironic nihilism failed, and the only thing that you've been taught, the only thing that you've been given, is this. This, this sort of political religion. And, and so what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to turn this, we're going to try to back a teleology out of it. We're going to try to re-enter history because when you get older, you have to enter history mm -hmm. because you you can literally feel your youth becoming historic, right? Uh, you know, once once yeah. you hear your favorite songs from the 90s on oldies mm -hmm. stations, although I don't think they have oldies stations anymore because we're all on the internet. But the, the concept's the same, right? Yeah. Once, once, once you see young kids 
Well, look at uh, Bonnie Tyler in the charts recently. And yeah. all of the Zoomers are like, oh, wow. It's like, oh, my God. This was old <laughs> when I was young. You know, it's like I, I'm feeling the weight of history on me now. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, yeah. when you compare when, say, it's something like The Little Mermaid came out mm. and think that that was, I don't know, it's like 30 something years ago, right? Uh, mm. Yeah. You, you sort of feel the weight of history very, very distinctly. Or, you know, you think about, when I was my son's age, I guess a lot of millennials can't do this. You feel that you're part of history. And and so now the eternal hedonists, the nihilists that thought everything was ironic, they had to figure out a way to live as historical animals in inside a political order that has really, I think, I don't know if you agree with this. I would say that our, that our current political order has pathologized every healthy way a person can be a, a person can be part of history if if you're not part of some protected class at least where i live it feels like that oh absolutely i mean i it's it's remarkable that in england you can't really fly an english flag it's wrong uh it's it's a moral wrong among the middle classes to fly an english flag and it's because england is a particular place with a particular purpose and everyone kind of knows it and no one wants to speak about it. You know, the Celts can have their flags, they can have their nationalist movements, uh, but you, you can't say that England exists uh, in England. And and I remember this commercial it, it, from the it, BBC. It, yeah. it just opens a big can of worms. Uh, so, the, the, it, yeah, there's, it's very much the case. Very much the case here. I remember this commercial from the BBC where uh, this, they explain how nothing is really English. Yes. I remember watching it kind of with my jaw dropping. Like, so, like, the thing is, like, you think this thing, you think you think a lot of things are English, but really almost nothing comes from England. And I sit there with my jaw open. Most yeah. things, if there has ever been a, a an area as small as England where more things come from, I don't think there is a single area as, as small as, as the space of England where, where more new human things have come out of. And the entirety of human history, mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would challenge anyone to, 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 to come up with an alternative. And yet, you know, we're going to lecture people about how nothing comes from England. This was just, it was this bizarre, like, clown world moment for me, seeing that and, and wondering, is this what the English are saying about themselves? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, well, I, think, I think there's a fairly strong argument to be made that England is the most significant culture in the modern world. It has had the largest impact on mm -hmm. on the world in the last say 300 years you know like it, it's been england that has been like the, that's underpinned everything that's happened in some way or another you know whether it's the common law whether it's the language whether it's the international order whether you know whether it's science whether it's there, yeah. there are so many so many small things now i'm not, I'm not trying to say this say on is in england great it, it, it's as you say like you wouldn't deny this if you're a foreigner you and I, I've again, I've been reading foreigners' opinions on England. A lot of them hate England, or at least they're kind of resentful about England because, in many ways, England lacks virtues where it could emphasize virtues, you know, in certain ways. Uh, the Germans famously like the English are intellectually lazy, so yeah, we are mm. because we have a comfortable island, we don't need to drive every contradiction to its most maximal extent. Uh, we, you know, we, we can actually just live side by side and just ignore them um, and things like mm -hmm. this. So you, 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 it's not that England is a perfect place or anything like that, but you can't say that it doesn't exist and it isn't influential and doesn't have a self-generative culture of its own. But that is exactly what you would hear from essentially the Blairite consensus. And it's such a weird thing because, I mean, that consensus itself is a form of English imperialism. <laughs> it's, it's a form of like, you know, English self-flagellation and supremacy. Like to say, actually, our culture is so ubiquitous, it doesn't even exist. And every other culture we look down into from our perspective of being like the unique individuals that float outside of history, that's something that's a product of England. That's the way that England sees itself in the world now. It needs to like compact itself back down to seeing them as people on either side rather than things from up above. But but they don't even understand that that is a product of English culture. And it's just like, right, okay, we are, we are lost. We are totally lost. We don't know what we're doing anymore. Well, I think the question is, is this, this is a process of deculturalization. 
that mm. you see not only in England, but in all Western countries. America, yeah. And, and yeah, for sure. And I'm sure that this is going to be pushed in, I think it's going to start being pushed in Asian countries as well. Okay. Although we'll see what will happen with, uh, you know, the sort of decidedly non-Western regimes in China and stuff like that. I think that they're going to they're they're going to go in a different direction. I think that this is a dead end for humanity. And uh, the the problem is is that the reason why. So it, you know, I'm not going to put too fine a point on this. Uh, Blair is part of a group of world leaders that came of age in the 1990s uh, that that believed that the only path forward for humanity was this kind of deracinated multiculturalism. And they created in the 90s a huge number of institutions. I believe one of them was the World Economic Forum. That, But these the specifics is almost immaterial. The only thing you need to know is that the people who have power and the people who set the tastes and the ruling consensuses all believe that human deracination is the only path forward for the human species. They are 100% in on that, and they are not investing in any alternative ideas. And their their only plan is, well, we'll just destroy all of the alternatives to deracinate to de- deracination, or or label them as racist, sexist, or homophobic. Every and, every particular culture will eventually be liquidated in the same way that our particular cultures have been. <clears throat> that's what, yes, that's what's going to happen. My guess that could happen, which is incredibly depressing because I think that's just a prefiguration hmm. to the human race abolishing itself in so many words. Obviously, the diversity. Yeah, well, it, it, well, actually, <laughs> true. Like the, the the genetic and cultural diversity of the human race, in my own mind, is an incredibly important thing. Uh, I, I I think that a human race that is cultural and genetically diverse is uh, an important thing to preserve in in the in the coming world. And that's not to say that, like, you know, obviously, I, uh, it, it implies respect for all peoples, but it also implies respect for certain m- amount of boundaries. Mm. And, and But this is not something that our ruling class is ready to hear or conceptualize in any way. And their only alternative seems to be just, and I think I think their vision is failing, because I don't think anyone believes in this anymore. I don't mm. think that anyone believes in the end of history i don't think anyone believes that deracination is is the is the ultimate end of well, like for, for instance when you look at someone like Vosh, i guess like you know maybe maybe certain elements of left tube or bread tube mm-hmm. maybe those guys are the last true believers in this but yeah. Bosch could be said and this applies to all bread tubers who are in the sphere he could be said and many people have said that he believes in nothing he just likes winning debates and he has to be on the right side of what we call the cathedral that's just the elite consensus that's just a shorthand for that so so he ends up being a leftist and it's always easier to win on the left than it is on the right so that's why he's an anarchist because it seems but Mm -hmm. but if you peel away his layers of of sort of bad faith and nihilism and autism, uh, no no disrespect to people who generally if, you, if you've got nothing to do one day, you may as well. <laughs> yeah, but but, but you, you'll discover that he does genuinely believe in something. What he genuinely believes in is is sort of this this sort of uh, the autonomy of deracinated individualism hmm. that that human beings need to have absolute liberty, which is sort of philosophically impossible. Uh, but but what what Vash absolutely believes in is that the most important freedom the individual has to have is from any kind of of constraint of, of culture and of order and of continuation and 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 of what anyone in previous civilization would have seen as the primary telos uh, some kind of order. I certainly believe God, um, but but if you're if you're Chinese maybe civilization or 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 the greater good um and to, to someone like Vosh or bread tube and and to to leaders like blair uh, those sort of greater cultural fixtures of teleology are fundamentally constraining and stifling uh to me you can't have meaningful liberty without them and that's the core of our of our contention is that the 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 anarchists like Vosh are actually closer to Blair uh, oh, yeah. than and this is I guess this is one way where the woke are are in my mind less well 
the woke are not only less correct than the mainstream, they are actually closer to the mainstream's mistake than the right wing. And that's on the question of, of, of deracination and, and ultimately embracing a teleology or a collective that's greater than yourself or a cause that's greater than yourself. And, and it's a core belief of people on the left that, that this is a bad thing. And it's a core belief from people on the right that this is a good thing. And you know, I think this is really the question that's going to be resolved in, in, well, in our present political discourse. Well, th this if if I can if I can loop us back then to where we began, where I was saying um, the right's argument will come from within the left. I actually think the argument from diversity is actually quite a powerful one. Uh, the the liquidation of all culture into creating individualized universal men who mm. exist outside of history and outside of any time or any place. Uh, that is not diversity, actually. That's homogeneity on a, a species-wide scale. Mm -hmm. And so this, this actually gives us a sort of in with the left on their quest for diversity. And it allows us to reframe the question, to say, no, you're against diversity. We're for diversity. You value this thing that we're for and you're against. You must change to suit us. And I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not saying this is like, you know, oh, we've figured it all out or anything. But you see what I mean? Like, the, we, even though we can't see it yet, I think that the answer will have to come from within the logic of the existing paradigm. And it's not that we're, we're, because I, I, I did think you were, you were giving the critical race theorists a bit short shrift when you say, well, they're just playing with words. It's like, they are, but it's more that they're playing with concepts, right? And mm -hmm. the words are just handy containers for the concepts. And it is the concepts that won the battle. You know, they could have called them something else. It was just politically effective to call what they mean as racism to be what you mean as racism, as in to, to shortcut a lot of things. And essentially, there's nothing wrong with the right doing the same sort of thing with diversity. Because as soon as you enter, say, well, I'm pro-diversity, they go, right, okay, I'm listening. You know, no, I don't see you as an enemy now. Now I see you as an ally because I'm looking for diversity as well. It's like, right. So that means we have to make sure that people feel like they're bearers of civilization because otherwise we become these deracinated universal men who don't have anything to be diverse about. And that's a different paradigm now. That's, you know, we burst through what they're doing in their ignorance into something new. Who knows? Uh, you know, I don't know where it will go or anything, but like you, you see, this is how the dialectic works, right? Well, I actually, I kind of want to parse it. I, I, I think I kind of disagree with you in one sense, but I think you've unveiled a deeper uh, issue or a deeper goal for the right. So I, I disagree with you in the fact that I don't think we can really copy the tactics of the left, and that's always something that I've been very, very cautious about because I don't think we're the same kind of thing. But, but I will say this: the the reason why the left owns diversity and multiculturalism and globalism and universalism, I, I one of the things I am on the right is I am a big advocate for universalism uh, and and I guess you could say diversity too, but I don't really make that uh, a buzzword of mine. And I, I don't like this idea that universalism is a bad thing. And one of the reasons why the left has been able to own these things and own the future conceptually hmm. is because they can march out on the world stage and say, we have a vision for how a world of many ethnicities is going to live together without getting in a big war. And I don't know if Tony Blair has said this, but I know European politicians in particular are very fond of this threat. They mm -hmm. say, if you don't give us uh, the EU, the Labour Party, or whatever the, the party is in Germany, Angela Merkel's party, I think it's Christian the Christian Democrats, Democrats, which is yeah. the greatest of ironies, in my opinion, of all time. Uh, the, the, if you don't give us exactly what we want, you'll all be digging trenches in the sown by Christmas, right? We'll go right back uh, to Verdun in 1915, is it, or whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know when that battle was fought, but uh, we'll, we'll go right back to World War I. We'll go right back to, to war, and, and modern warfare is so horrific. Uh, no one wants to be fighting uh, robotic dogs with machine guns mounted on their backs and getting hit by drones. And, 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 and you know, this, what, what they really taunt the right wing with is they taunt the right wing for having not necessarily no uh, vision uh, for for the future, because indeed right wingers all do, and in, in sort of a Chomskyan sense, all our visions might be different on the particulars, but they have a certain family resemblance that's unmistakable. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but what they really taunt the right wing with is having no vision for how to bring together uh, a multiplicity of peoples and not have it devolve into war. And I'm not so sure what the solution is going to be to this problem. I think there will have to be one. But I think already this idea that the the the, the left wing or, or Joe Biden holds sort of the keys to the castle for a stable world order, I think that might be meaning its end in, in a lot of these disastrous foreign policy adventures that have erupted under his watch, like Afghanistan. Well, he did, it didn't erupt, but it, it kind of hit a hit a brick wall under his watch. And, and then the also the, whole, yeah, the, 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 the Ukrainian thing as well. Mm. I, mean, I, I think that they're going to lose. It's going to become apparent, I think, in a few years that these people who, who, who call themselves the masters of the of the peaceful world order or anything but and their their formula is just a formula for continuously uh concocting international disasters oh, i think you're completely right and i i so i uh I, i'll invoke uh, nietzsche there and say your concern about using the language of the left is merely a moral prejudice uh <laughs> and we need to be go beyond good and evil here uh and br burst through this horizon <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I just think it doesn't work. I think it is. I think the left's language is a, is a language of uh, uh, of obscuring truth, and and I want and to use yet language. You used it. You were like, I'm for diversity and a multiplicity. You know, it's, you fell into it because that's yeah. true. So, like, you know, it's a moral. Pro and I appreciate why you have it. Don't get me wrong, because it's it's very easy to go. Well, look, everything about them is disgusting, covered in slime, and I don't want to be touched by it. Uh, I have a natural revulsion to the way that they are as people, as a movement, as, you know, what they do, and I can completely understand. But also, uh, no one ever won a war, conquered the world without getting their hands dirty. So yeah. maybe maybe we have to accept that, you know, just, just get our heads down and push right through this. Um, I like that. I'm not saying I've got the answers or anything, but I think that I can see a weakness that we could, we could yeah. attack, you know. But uh, but I, I like, like, like you're saying, I, I think... I think there is something there and it's not wrong for us to assert ourselves in that way. I mean, they assert themselves all the time. So the, the right like is, is looking for its ability to formulate a will to power that exists within a framework that won't just get them shot right by the powers that be. Well, um, yeah, that's the problem is that the right mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be able to put together anything in any modern Western country that mm -hmm. can institutionally recognize itself. And this has been, I don't know. I, 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 I'd like to think that we're on the cusp of solving this problem, but uh, no, we've got no a long way to go. Yeah. No, no. This is why I'm in favor of us continuing to flay. You know, come on, let's take off more layers. Let's, let's get rid of the, you know, anything, anything that can go should go. And like in Peterson's dictum, you know, burn mm. it all off, see what's at the very core. And if it's worthy, then you can begin. You know, that's, yeah. I, I think that's what we need to do. That, that is absolutely the case. And this is why I think, you know, I, we're, we're going to have to see how this plays out, but it's it's um it's interesting. I mean, what is your take on the whole uh, political situation that we're experiencing now in America? Uh, looking from across the pond, I don't want to keep you too late, but uh, no, no, no. Well, it's, it, 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 um, if you want, if after after I've answered this, we want to do super chats. That should be. I actually don't have super chats turned on. Maybe I can turn them on via wise. entropy. Uh, <laughs> Well, let me let me let me see if I can turn. <laughs> That's turn so interview. virtuous, Dave. Why not? <laughs> I actually turned off. I demonetized my channel. I only use Entropy because I was pissed off at Google or whatever. Right, right. Um, yeah. But it's uh, very virtuous. I'm impressed. But you should uh, turn them on because it, you know. My my uh, wife, I, I, my wife gives me I um, shit for this all the time. Yes, I bet she does. You know, sorry, you're turning down free money, are you? Yes. That's rather silly. You're doing the labor and not getting paid. That's, that's not on. And the thing is, you've got to remember as well, right? There are people in your audience who see it as part of their virtuous duty to support the content creators that they like. And obviously you being one of those content creators that they like, they, you know, it's not fair to deny them their ability to self-actualize, right? You know, yes. I, I do the same, you know, with, with people, you know, that I like, I'll donate something. And if they were to deny me that, I'd actually feel quite annoyed about it because I want to support what they're doing. So, um, but I mean, doing it via entropy rather than doing it via Google, that's very sensible. You know, yeah. you can't even, you can't even, you know, say that you're doing something wrong now. So, well, um, I put the entropy link in the chat. I need to pin this. Um, okay, I think that did it. Good. Um, so if you want to send 
Carl, I think, you know, I'll, I'll stay on to answer super chats. I usually try not to keep guests more than two hours, but, but, but to get back to my original question, what is the, um, uh, what is your take on America? I'm kind of curious to hear. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hilarious. Yeah. Um, uh, do you know, I, the, I think the greatest thing happened the other day uh, with regards to the Biden administration. Mm -hmm. And that is that Joe Biden announced that he had cancer and everyone was like, no, that was a senior man. <laughs> like literally actually, yeah. everyone. Actually, I have COVID. <laughs> yeah, but just, I mean, when the president of the United States publicly announces that he has cancer and everyone thinks, oh no, actually that's just the dementia talking. Yeah. Then, and, and that was, I was watching all the angles, all angles were just like, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. This, he, he obviously doesn't. He's just, you know, and that, that to me was just like the peak clown world, right? Yeah. You know, how it, it couldn't be any more obvious that Joe Biden is not steering the ship. It couldn't be any more obvious that there isn't a legitimate regime in control of the United States at this point. Uh, this, this, this is truly like, you know, behind the curtain stuff now. It's like, okay, what's the White House's official position on the president's opinions, you know, like this. And so it, it's not good. And the Republicans seem to be doing a fair amount of rallying at the moment, which is good because there's, there's a big fear that uh, fortification will happen again. And doubtless fortification will happen. But I think people have got to remember it takes a lot of energy to fortify something and you have to well, essentially get the get the drop on people you know when when they're not really expecting something to go down then it, it, it you know it can it's a lot easier for it to go down so they can't really do it twice in a row without it becoming a real eyesore you know without it becoming something that becomes very very obvious and i mean at least politically half your country are pretty based actually i mean i got i wish that half of my country was nearly as red pilled as the americans um so there, there is that you've got going for you. And there's a, this there is what is, they say. The, the famous Yarvin quote is that these bad ideas emerged in America. Uh, and that's why we have like the, the, the sort of natural predators to them also emerged. Yeah, so, yeah. so the, uh, you know, th that's why there's a little bit more immunity in America than there is in Europe. Although uh, we're, we're closer to the source of these bad ideas. Well, the, the, the thing that American Republicans need to remember is they're not conservatives, they're Whigs. And mm. that means they've got a normative ideological framework to assert. And it's actually a very strong one and a very, it, it's one that w carries a lot of legacy goodwill. You know, the constitution, you know, the, the like w what we would call classical liberalism, but they call constitutionalism. Uh, th this is a very powerful uh, set of doctrines and it has a normative vision. And so it can actually say, no, it should be this way because this is how the document is written. Therefore, you guys are wrong and evil and stupid, right? And so the, the American Republicans actually have quite a strong position to work from against what I, I view the Democrats as being like French continental liberals, basically. Um, but, yeah, no, no one believes in the Constitution anymore. Like, I, don't, I don't know. I, I feel like, few, like almost none of the ruling class does. And, no, I'm not saying the ruling class. I'm saying, well, uh, well... I think that there are the, the Republican elites do, you know, I, I, I've, I've spoken to oh, yeah. lots of diehard Republicans and they are Christian. They are constitutionalists. And I think they really believe it. You know, they really, I think they do genuinely believe it. Uh, but you are right. Like there's a, there is a large swathe on the other side that are just kind of cringing at it, you know, but the, there's a sincerity that the Republicans have that we lack in Britain for any kind of, uh, what 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 you guys you guys can call your traditions because they are mm. your traditions, um, and so there there is a strength in that, and that's good. You know that's something, and so I, I'm seeing the Republicans rallying a lot, being like, right, okay, we're gonna we're gonna come back with a fucking hammer blow on this. It's like, okay, well, you know, we're trapped in the paradigm of democracy, so good luck. You know, the the Democrats do seem to be profoundly weak. On every front, on culture, they seem to be failing. On politics, they seem to be failing. On the economy, on every on every front, like internationally, like they have had just L after L after L, and mm. then like the the guy in charge, yeah, I've got cancer, and everyone's like, no, you don't, shut up, you know, we we wish, you know, it's like you you're an idiot, you know, and it's like, look, this the the edifice itself of the of the Democrats and the left in the, in America is frail. It's really fucking frail. And in the background, you've got the looming figure of Trump, you know, and it's, everyone's like, oh, is it going to be dissent? No, it's not. It's going to be Trump, right? It's going to be Trump because narratively, that's how it should be. 
right? Trump yeah. is the guy who, you know, there are people who I, I we're on YouTube, so I won't, you know, but it, he's the guy who's been wronged, right? There mm -hmm. is a narrative arc that is left uncompleted here. It should be Trump. It should be Trump. He needs to come back and fucking smash them. The they story is lose. that, yeah. Yes, exactly. And he's in the wilderness at the moment. He's in Sherwood Forest at the moment. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's, you know, but he needs to come back and he needs to fucking win. Win bigly, really bigly. Uh, and absolutely fucking hammer them and make them know that they lost. And at the moment, they've got nothing to resist him. Like they have no one who can fill, fit the bill. I mean, who would you put up against Trump? In, in I, the, I don't think a Democrat. Trump can win because not because I don't think he would win in a like fair fight, but <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if the Democrats are going to do this. But this whole January sixth hearing, it's very obvious to me mm. what the goal is. The reason why they're using the word insurrection is mm. because there's a clause in the Constitution that prohibits insurrectionists from running for office. Mm. That does not mean I don't think Congress will have the ball, balls to, on the federal level, bar a person from running for office based on his uh, on 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 on. But what, what I believe, I don't know they'll if they'll do this. We'll try this. What they'll try to do is this. We'll try, we'll try to do is they'll they'll try to make an unofficial statement from the committee that Trump is recognized by the January sixth committee as an insurrectionist. Mm -hmm. They'll try to have Congress ratify Trump as an insurrectionist, mm -hmm. with with the with the pretense that this that what they'll the, they'll they'll get they'll get the moderates on board by saying like oh this is not this doesn't have teeth in it we're not legalizing him from running but they'll like well, we just want you to say Trump is an insurrectionist and then what they'll do is on the state level that they, they will go and say you know we are vote in solidarity with the constitution to make sure insurrectionists mm -hmm. can't be on the ballot. And mm -hmm. this, the, the, there'll be a movement in several states to take Trump's name off the ballot under the pretense that he tried to instigate an insurrection to get the federal government. Maybe. And then w once a candidate's name does not appear on a ballot, like he's not going to win the popular vote period. The, the elections are too close. And th then they'll have the mechanisms for which to deny him the office in any under any conditions that they wanted now i think if they if they take this route and it seems like they are taking this and i i wonder if there is going to be a cooler head in the democratic party that's going to tell them not to do this but they're going to come if, if trump stops appearing on some ballots they're going to totally delegitimize the results of american elections for the foreseeable of future chaos gonna be chaos and i i get to smile about this because it's not my country right but fuck me like it, so you i mean that's that's it's entirely possible that that is what they're trying to pursue but why you know why do they want to do this and it's because they know they've got nothing else if this grand plan doesn't work they're not going to stop trump trump is going to come back because his arguments are so strong you remember four years ago how good it was you remember how much it cost the fill up your car you remember how much money you had you remember that everyone was like essentially genuflecting to the giant orange douche in the white house you know doing all these stuff his his argument is really really strong the democrats argument is really fucking weak they've ruined the economy they've ruined everything everything's falling apart and everyone can see it like i you can see it like there's 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 something in the air right and so that's the only reason they'd need to go through all of these, you know, like legal loopholes and stuff like that. And even then, even then, like, I don't know, man, there's something about the way that energy flows that even if they can do this, I'm not sure it's going to work. Like, I think I, I, I don't have a prediction or anything like that, but. Well, it's not going to work in the long term. We, I don't know. No, what, no, no. You know, in the long term, it, it can't sustain itself. But but I don't even know if it works in the short term, right? Because I mean, like, let's say for I don't know, you know, pick a state that they they could take him off the ballot where it'd matter, right? Because I mean, if you take Virginia, him off New York, Virgi Virginia, right, okay. Virginia. Okay, so, Let's, but let's, but let's, if let's, they no, take no, him no. off the ballot in California, he will never win the popular vote because that, that's a huge percentage of the country right there, right? Yeah, but and the popular vote doesn't actually decide the president, does it? It, it doesn't, but well, it doesn't, but it, it doesn't, but it, it creates situations where uh, narratively they questions can, legitimacy. Yeah, exactly, and that's yeah. it's kind of stupid because the Trump does so little to them in office that 
if they didn't overreact to this, they wouldn't even really have a problem. It's like the whole Gamergate <laughs> thing, right? Like it's the if 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 the if the people who who were kind of targeted in Gamergate didn't react, the whole thing would have come to nothing. It's it's the yeah. It's the reaction that creates the legitimacy crisis for these people. And the more and more you realize is that they have to react in this hyperbolic way mm. because their core constituencies demand that they do. Mm. That's why they do this. And it's not because I, th I think that are just, this is happening because they're really, really forced into, they're either stupid or they're forced into a position where they're, they have to uh, do things that are stupid. So the the like as I understand it, Trump had pretty good support in Virginia. Um, is that mm -hmm. correct? So uh, imagine... well, it's a swing state, so he would have you know it would have yeah. gone either way. You know, it's sure. it's a country. So, so it, a, or it's yeah. a state that its elite is incredibly blue, but its sort of yeah, core base is incredibly red. Lands are very red. Yeah. Uh, so okay, let, let's say that that's what they do. Well, what happens then? Uh, I mean, it's entirely possible that literally millions of people in Virginia just write his name on the ballot or something like that. Or yeah. there's something worse that happens to them, you know, because it'll be <coughs> it'll be an undeniable maneuver that, again, it, like Trump's base is really big and millions of people will have seen them get screwed. Right. And then they'll be like, right, they're screwing me. So who knows? You know, I, who knows what the knock on effect of these things are? But I don't think it will go smoothly. And if. Essentially, I think it will come down to them either, I mean, maybe even triggering a civil war or just essentially biting the bullet and being like, right, okay, we're going to have to have an election with Trump uh, and Trump's going to steamroll them. And that's good. You know, so that's that's something um, that's not going to be the end of the problems or anything like this, blah, blah, blah. But it, it, yeah. it's at least a win. You know, I'm going to take a win. You know, and I'd like to see the Trump story arc completed <laughs> to satisfaction. <laughs> You know, the, um, but it but it puts us in a better position than if we lose, right? So, well, see, actually, you came to a really critical point, and I think that you kind of drew these two things together. Um, what we're what we're competing over here, and, and the reason why this is not so, like on paper, uh, if, if if we just looked at this in terms of Machiavellian politics, or if you had an alien that could only look at this thing in terms of Machiavellian politics, the whole thing seems stupid. Because the best game theoretic move for the Democrats is to let Trump win. And then just like, the entire government just shuts down and doesn't do anything. Like, because most of the elected government is Democrats, and they'll just, mm. they just won't carry out as well. And then, you know, he, he goes four years, doesn't do anything, and then leaves, and then that's the end of it. Okay. Right. And that would be the, that would be like the the chess move, Machiavellian politics, best thing to do for them. But but I think you highlighted, when you use the word, the Trump story, we're not fighting over uh, who passes X bill through Congress. Mm. We're fighting over when this gets written down in the history books, what is the story yeah. of Donald Trump and the story of America? And the story that the Democrats want to tell is he fought us and he went down in a ball of flames because everyone who fights us directly uh, is discredited and disproved. We are and, infallible. That's yeah, exactly. Question. We're in, we're infallible. And and if we ever fail, it's because no one could have done anything better. Now, the reason why Chicago and California and Detroit are shitholes, mm. and I spent most of my life, I've spent a long time living both in California and Seattle and Portland and Detroit, uh, the reason why civilizers are shitholes is that no one could have ever done anything better. It just the gods willed it, right? And the problem is, is, is what what the Democrats are going for, and the reason why they keep on making these stupid decisions is because they're trying to steer the government not so that they can maintain control. They already control it, in my opinion. It's they're trying to steer it so that they can tell a good story, and it, because in order to put this behind them, they need to tell a story to their followers about what happened, and nothing so far has given them that story. And that's what January 6th hearings are about. And it's, I don't know, I don't think they've thought of a good story about what the future of Trump or what the future of, 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 of Trump's political career is going to look like. But you know, you notice they, they, they've painted themselves into a corner that's not very envious because in every way, the left wing narrative is about perfection. Right. They they are flawless. They can never admit they made a mistake because all of their actions are deduced from a priori principles. And if they admit there's a mistake, then there's some mistake in their logic that they have to follow back to mm. the initial theorizing, which means there's something wrong with leftism itself. Right. Mm. And that's off the table. 
We can't have that. And therefore, it has to be something evil interfered with our glorious plans to bring about the revolution, right? Yeah. And so it, their, their narrative, like Trump's narrative isn't that, right? Trump can fail in Trump's narrative. And, you know, the previous election could be seen in Trump's narrative as that the nadir in sort of act two, when the, the empire strikes back, you know, and it, okay, well, how does this end? Well, it ends with the, the, the guy picking himself up and then going, smashing him anyway, you know, like, you know, it, it, he doesn't have to project actually having never made a mistake, whereas they do because their narrative is based on the idea that they are actually right about everything and they always have been. Uh, that's, you know, that's not the same for the right-wing narrative. And so the, the right-wing narrative is actually a lot more robust than the left-wing narrative. It, it, and that's it's right. robust because the left-wing narrative needs to be a religion for its adherents, yeah. whereas yeah, no, no, Trump exactly is simply right. an operator for the right-wing. He's Tr simply Trump a, is a hero. Trump is yeah. the hero, right? He's, he's the hero of the story. And that's fine, you know, it's, it's, and that, that's, that's got ups and downs, you know, that every hero has ups and downs. That's part of the journey, you know, uh, but the, but the left are not doing that. You as you said, they're, they're creating like a religious narrative. And I think that's why you get the sense of desperation that is, and that's the thing that comes out of the Democrats for me as a foreigner looking at your politics, the Democrats look desperate. They look weak and sickly, like they're panicking, like AOC is this weird, <laughs> Like, no, no, genuinely, like, she's yeah, no, a very powerful very person. Yeah. She's but there's something. Is there, but, yeah, she really is. But there's something desperate and weird and creepy about her. That, like, it, like whatever the, 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 you know, the facade is, everything always looks like it's about to break, you know? And it, they, they look, and they look like they think, you know, we've got to get, we've got to just say the same thing, even if it looks ridiculous, because otherwise a crack appears in the narrative, in the mirror, and it spreads, and so suddenly you can see our hideous visage, you know? Yeah. And so uh, so you, then you get, like, the Jen Psaki style, saying ridiculous shit in front of millions of people, and you're like, no one believes you. But if yeah. you all commit to the lie, then we don't have the power to, like, you know, leverage you over with that. And so, so you're just sat there, and so you're lying, we know you're lying, and you know we know that you're lying, and yet you're still lying anyway. It's that sort of effect. And so it's like, right, okay, this perfection is not true and it will break and trump should be the guy to do it to me i think I, I really want trump to be that guy trump is a hero biden is simply a mouthpiece for the religion he's, of progress he's a prophet of progressivism he's, he's like not the, even the villain that's the yeah, thing he's and, not even the villain and, and you see the like aoc is i mean she's suffering from this weird kind of imposter syndrome because mm -hmm. she's put into a position that she knows is not really her like so her her the the role she's playing in the progressive story is the the progressive story is that old white men ruined america and oh wow here come you know the 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 transgender women pocs to set everything right uh aoc in her heart of hearts does not actually want to rule america she no. she, she wants to be recognized as somebody who's a moral person as a good person mm as and she she kind of wants to she kind of wants to be part of a story herself but the story uh aoc wants to be part of is she wants to be kind of kind of part of uh, she wants to be a tragic heroine and in her heart of hearts she wants to be somebody yeah. who uh, was wrong was done against her and then you know it was rectified when the system came in and and restored justice to her which is a very common female heroine story and, uh, and but, throughout throughout this as well her heart was pure that's her heart the, was pure, yeah. The, you know, the, the thread that, that goes through her life. She wants, that's how she wants people to think of her, pure of heart. But you see, that's not the role that, that progressivism, the, 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 the spirit of progressivism has selected for her the role of, of savior king. And she's totally unsuited to play that role. She, she cannot hold power. She cannot own power yeah. uh, because, because she doesn't take responsibility for things. Everything is somebody else's fault. And, and and because and, and to belie that, I mean, she's she's naturally an imposter, not because she, well, she I, I I make no statement about whether she's intelligent or not, but but she's imagistically and in her own mind, she's not in the role that I think that the the progressive narrative itself really requires her to occupy, and so there's like this really massive uh, narrative and psychological misfit uh, between but the person who she is and and what she's expected to do. 
the, the imposter syndrome thing is definitely correct. Definitely correct. Um, she, you, you are, you are definitely right about that. You are definitely right. She, she's very good though, right? People have got to remember, you've got to recognize your enemy's virtues. She isn't stupid. What she is, is not, um, technical, I guess is mm -hmm. the best way to put it. Um, she's an amazing communicator. She's an amazing yeah. people person. Uh, you know, she, she makes the, she makes her fans feel valued and moral and part of a great crusade. And that's a very, very powerful set of attributes. Uh, but you are right. She, she herself doubtless feels like an imposter when she turns off the Instagram feed and then put, you know, lays in bed and goes, Oh my God, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? I don't know. You know, I'm sure she does. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that, uh, AOC can never, I mean, she's actually said like, I'm the boss, I'm the decider. She's mm. said things like that, but that sort of felt like the most false thing she's ever really said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she's I, possessed I by a spirit. As you said, the spirit yeah. of progressivism does po possess her. She's not the boss at all. But she, she always has to be ascendant and never ascended. Mm. If she ever is ascended, then the, the, the spell of her own charisma immediately sort of falls through in, in a very big way. And, and that's, yeah. that's sort of the, the problem we're dealing with. Uh, if, if, if the progressive coalition ever, ever says that we've come into power fully, then, 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 then its own majesty kind of deteriorates away from it. So she only has one option though. She, she essentially has to become like Daenerys Targaryen. If, if she's never, if she doesn't like achieve the plateau of ascension, if, uh, then she's either got to collapse downwards or become the inquisitor that she promises to be on the ascent upwards. She's, she's always promising to essentially extirpate all of her ideological enemies, all of her moral enemies, mm -hmm. you know, and she's constantly, we should do this. We should do that. It's like, okay, if you were given the keys to the kingdom as you, as you're looking for now, you're going to have to essentially like start flamethrowering all of these evil people because in every way she cast, she frames them as being like, as, uh, as, Alinsky would put it the the narrative she spins is always the enemy is 100% evil therefore good is 100% on our side and therefore the only just thing would be to essentially eradicate them from existence and so she would have to become Daenerys Targaryen once she gained that potential power okay well the bad guys are there you've told us that they're villains deal with them and so I think she would I think she would actually buckle at that point I don't think she's got it in her well I mean Daenerys Targaryen's feels heel turn was probably the only good thing about the last season of game of thrones well yeah obviously. it's the only thing that made uh yeah. narrative sense in my opinion and, and same here yeah the um the it's interesting to see because it we're, we're dealing with a, just an imaginative problem i can't imagine this system of progressive ascendancy in in positions of cultural power uh crumbling away but it it, it also can't survive so uh, if it wins, it'll be even worse, though. If, like, it's given unfettered access to everything, it'll be awful. Like, yes. it'll be really awful. Well, I mean, if they if they get this transgender stuff through, that's sort of what we're yeah. looking at, right? This, If they get unfettered access to, to all childcare, sure. and that's... I mean, then, then we're looking at, you know, I think some serious problems uh, where we already are, right? But I mean, I've been saying to people that the horror is only just beginning. Like, we're in the opening stages of the terrible things that they will do when there's no resistance. So you're aware of like Noah Smith, right? The uh, or, sorry, he, uh, you probably aren't. He's um, no. I don't know why I'm aware of him. Even he's just he's basically just your standard shit lip. I think he writes for the Atlantic or something like that. But, but <laughs> right, okay, for, yeah. for some reason, uh, it doesn't. Well, well, okay, I don't know why, but for some reason, in the mind of most reactionaries and most dissident writers, everyone follows Noah Smith because he's like the platonic form of what people like. We don't want to shit. Uh, we don't want to straw man people, right? What, what's his it, Twitter at? Sorry, um, I, Noah Opinion. I think uh, right. it's actually uh, what he says is actually entirely uninteresting. Uh, the sure. only interesting thing is is that the fact that he kind of represents uh, if I were to like create a platonic form of a progressive man who's not a complete idiot yeah. then I would probably say like Noah Smith I think Yarvin said he's the best of the normie mind um, but but he's he's of the opinion that like oh well this woke stuff it's on its way out it, it, it's it's peaked is, is what he recently said 
Uh, this stuff is on its way out, but it certainly has not peaked. Like they are mm -hmm. consolidating power in hard science now. Like, like the cancer has reached into medical journals. It's reached into nature. Uh, we cannot necessarily discern uh, deep politicized opinions on virtually any topic. And so the right's real challenge at this stage is how do we discern true facts from false ones if, if all of our scientific facts are necessarily coming to us from 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 a horribly politically biased uh, source that's naturally going to lie to us? That's a great question. I yeah. don't have an answer to it, unfortunately. But uh, but one, one thing I think uh, people like Noah should think about is like this wave of wokeism might die. But it will come back because what it is really is the final form of left-wing ideology. Like, they'll never be able to get away. It's the lodestone that is pulling them, the magnetic pole that pulls the left to do anything is what wokeism is essentially professing. You know, we want total and absolute freedom from any restrictions because restrictions themselves are a form of oppression. So, okay, well, there we go. That's, that's the left. That is the, the magnetic north of the left. And every compass that every leftist has points in that direction. And so eventually, some new form of wokeness will come out arguing for the same thing. Mm. Yeah, it's like the, there's this tanky uh, the other day, like yesterday, who's complaining that all those new recruits were just uh, autistic trans people. And the, se the, second, yeah, the second he tried to impose any constraints, they just bucked against it. And uh, yeah, it's just that, but that is that is the ultimate fate of these these movements is that they can't they can't create boundaries around anything. No, and it's it's freedom from boundaries that animates them to do anything. So, so yeah, anyway. Anyway, well, I think I kind of have you at time here. If you want to stay on and answer super chats, uh, sure. or do you have anything else you want to talk about? Or I think we could talk for ages, but we probably have to uh, cap yeah, well, at some point. Uh, yeah, we, um, let's do the Super Chats, and what we'll do is we'll just do another one of these like next month or something, man, because oh, I yeah, really sure, enjoyed sure. the conversation. I, I yeah. thought it was a really, really fun conversation, and uh, I, I've been looking forward to talking to you. I, like, it's like, like I'm saying, listen to all your podcasts. I'm like, right, okay, I can see where you're going. You know, I see what you're doing. I, yeah. I, to tell you the truth, Carl, I always want to call you Sargon. Um, I, 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 being being a, a live stream podcaster is uh, – I. I I don't like it, um, I because I always I always took pride in the fact that I was a video essayist and not a streamer. Uh, but unfortunately, my life is just at the point where I have a very difficult time making edited videos these days, and so I, I just have to I have to podcast instead. Right? Well, you're sort of a stream of consciousness essayist, in the yeah, way, right? Because uh, like, it's let's not go like with you're. That. You're not you're not doing a voice where you're just like no you're wrong and you're a fucking racist <laughs> like you're 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 providing analysis it's just in a less polished um, uh, medium right but which is fine you know yeah we we just have to get to the point with with the with the with the baby where he sleeps through the night and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> good luck <laughs> um, yeah uh, so unfortunately guys I don't have the super chat thing in a position where it actually displays on the screen because I don't think Entropy does that. Uh, maybe there's a plugin, but I'll just read them out. So thanks to everyone who donated to me on Entropy. Uh, for, for this time, you'll have, to, you'll have to tolerate me reading and maybe mispronouncing what you wrote. So Antimatter Bone Crusher for $3 asks, I have a unifying declaration for the right. Order and hierarchy are really universal. Equality is a fantasy. Uh, well, that's, that's a good. Uh, the, the problem with hierarchy is that you can't have general hierarchy. Uh, and and so you, you can have sort of general chaos, which is why, uh, you know, the, 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 the left has an easier time unifying. And also, <laughs> that seems like something that only wins over the already converted. It's a, it's a bit, it lacks finesse, right? It, it's not, it's not something that, triggers people to think it, it's more like a declaration of war mm -hmm. yeah and um well this is always the one thing with you know i, I appreciate the wiggest perspective but i i i am um, i'm going to urge you sargon to convince uh just becoming a jacobite right it's not too late to uh it's not too late to get the uh to, to undo the william of orange uh bad decision and get the stewards back you know <laughs> Uh, I think it might be way too late for that, to be honest. Ah, uh, no, they're, they're still, they're still, they're still. 
I, I've been told that there are still Stuart Kings and in, 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 in on the continent somewhere and in, in like oh, that. Or but, I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, but I didn't um, know that. But, uh, no, but I think I think he's way too late for that. But but, but on the hierarchy front, though, uh, the, the criticism I'm sure you're aware of is that Whigism is always uh, it's always bent in the direction of the left. Like it, it yeah. It, it tries to maintain a position, but it always slides down towards it because the incentives for the dem democratic urge are always to deconstruct norms in order to free up power for for the democratic process to consume. Right. Well, so, Whigism is political philosophy for devout Christians, and if you're not a devout Christian, you shouldn't be a Whig. Yes, so. and, and but but it, it works with Christians because there's an eternal law that cannot backslide. <laughs> once once all laws become simply pronouncements of of dead men, then yeah. then the the sort of left wing backslide becomes. Uh, well, it, they point. become French revolutionaries, and they've got no other, nowhere else to go. Yeah, and exactly. so it's. It's inevitable that if you're not essential, this this is why people are like, oh, are you an atheist? It's like, well, I mean, yeah, but <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I don't, I, I'm not in any way interested in undermining Christianity or anything like that. And you know, if someone's like, well, are there are there good morals in Christianity? I'm like, mm, yes, okay, moving on. You know, <laughs> like. <laughs> Well, how does it? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't have a two thousand year old religion that conquers the world if it's got nothing decent about it, you know. And and more importantly, it's our tradition. All right, we've yeah. got nothing else, so no, just suck it up. <laughs> That's how I feel about it at this point. Just suck it up. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, eventually, there's going to have to be, I think, a coming to terms with with religion in some form. I think, yeah, yeah. The god of the philosophers probably will work for a lot of people in this interim, but the god of philosophers is never a stable. Like in the Dark Ages, or not the Dark Ages, but the pre-Dark Ages, the decline of the Roman Empire, uh, Christianity's rivals were not like paganism proper. They were all of these oh, like Mithraism uh, and fucking yeah. Um, oh, what else was that? There were the loads Gnosticism, of but yeah, uh, yeah. Like th these were Manichaeism and stuff like this. These were, uh, and, and, and they were all kind of cults derived from the philosophers' gods, right? And what I what I imagine historically, as Argon is going to happen is. Uh, uh, people in your position might embrace the Platonic God, but your great grandchildren are going to have a religion that is going to be more populated. <laughs> With um, I throw it out there, right? Um, you know, but uh, but uh, that 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 seems to be the course of of human history, right? That well, here's something interesting. Uh, my seven year old son Daniel, um, mm -hmm. about a year ago, he said, "Oh, I believe in God. I I believe in Jesus," and I was like. That's great. Mm -hmm. And I didn't do anything to dissuade him. And 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I would have been like, there's no such thing. Some blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so you can see how much I've changed. Uh, I, I, in fact, he, I, this is good. I don't know why I find this embarrassing to say, mm -hmm. but I tell him off when he takes the Lord's name in vain. I'm, I'm horrible at that. I've been raised as an atheist and I always take the Lord's name in vain. I need to really yeah, work I, on my I swearing. Do too, but I make sure that he doesn't. Because it's wrong for him to do it, and yeah, I, true. and th this this is what my grandfather did to me, and it's proper that that's the case. And so whenever he says, "Oh my God," I say, "Oi, oh my gosh," and I'm not even joking that I do this. I'm not even joking that I do this. This is genuinely something I do, and I enforce it with infallible uh, p uh, boundaries. It, every time, I d I never let it go, no matter what he's doing. It's the same as when he eats with his mouth open. I just wait. Mm. Don't, don't do that, you know, every single time. Uh, just because, I, and I don't know why. Like I said, I'm not a Christian, I'm not religious. But he said he he wants to be. And I, I don't know why, where he's got this from. I assume it's from his school. Um, but it's very tepid, you know. And I do nothing to, yeah. like, you know, persuade him into it. But I'm, I'm happy to make sure that there's something that he can feel that there's something there. And I don't want to ever feel that he, you know, can work, grow up and say, oh, no, my dad kind of undermined that. I don't want ever that to be the case. My, 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 uh, yeah, my, my parents are kind of more on the atheist side, but it's, it's weird. It's weird how this thing evolves. There's a conversation and we can't have this conversation today because there's not enough time, but no, no. there, there's a dialogue to be had between, um, uh, Christians and, and pagans. Uh, mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, I get the pagan perspective. Like I know like this intuitive spirituality that's not located in, in a single, like I feel it, but I think that, you know, I think ultimately, uh, the future is going to look a little bit like, you know, it's going to, there's some question. Yes. 
I, there are just certain spiritual questions that get posed to paganism that it seems to be sort of a degenerate state where these questions kind of drive in the direction of monotheism naturally. And, and because of that, I, um, you know, I, I obviously can't promise the Christian, I hope the Christians, the future will be Christian, but I feel very definitively that the future of humanity has to look more like an Abrahamic style religion than what people were worshiping in like ancient or, or pre-Christian in Norway. Uh, but this is neither here nor there, so I have to I have to go on. Um, Blow in the dark for ten dollars. Uh, the problem with taking up the left's terminology, such as diversity, is that it denies that a right from forming its own sense of self separation from the left, making it easier to subvert us again. If the right can develop itself in its own cultural makers and phrase, uh, own cultural markers, I think and phrases, it can resist the left far better. Uh, and it has a better chance of creating its own cultural norms. Uh, Sargon, it's, I think, directed towards you. Yeah, um, I I think that uh, there's a a will in the right to pretend that leftism was delivered to us by aliens. It was just inflicted upon us as a great wound by the gods of chaos. But I think we have to accept that actually it's something we, the right, have created, right? It's come out of us. Um, it's come out of our civilization. It's a part of our civilization. Uh, and so rather than extirpate it, I think a synthesis has to be created with it uh, in order to make our civilization whole. There's so much to unpack in that. I know, I know. <laughs> the seeds of chaos and destruction always arise as a heresy and not as an alien force to the civilization that preceded them. That is absolutely mm. true. Uh, mm -hmm. And certainly a synthesis has to be made with some elements of leftism but there can be no compromise between chaos and order and on that i'm very there firm on. Be, I, there has to be a compromise there, is it that no that, that some some, chaos has some to be driven level. back and the order has to be restored and chaos sure. will emerge again for sure but well that's that's the point though the, it, it's you're you're trying to destroy something that can't be destroyed and trying to deny a part of yourself that can't be extirpated and so essentially what you need to do is what pizza would say you know you want order obviously but there has to be some room for unpredictability there has to be some flexibility in the order in order to make sure that you don't have a tyrannical structure that people desire to avoid to desire to get out of and this is the this is the question for the right. But like you say, it's a big I'm, I'm discussion. Full, I'm, I'm totally on board with with yeah. with not being tyrannical. That is one hundred percent. Like I don't want to exert any more control than is absolutely necessary to maintain goodness and order. Some but there is chaos. There's a well, no, but I don't. Well, I mean, I, I, chaos, and this is the eternal question in in Christianity because chaos. If you're aware of the Book of Genesis, the the, the word for Hebrew chaos is the description of the world before God looks at it. And typically chaos is more or less equivalent to just what God does not look at. And so the question is, is before humans fall, did chaos have, is it sort of a necessary component? Like, is it sort of a necessary counterbalance to, to that, that creates change or is it just evil? Because humans experience chaos pretty much synonymously with evil. And, you know, this is the, an eternal theological question and, and philosophers have weighed. This is philosophical metaphysics you'll probably don't need to get involved in. But, but this touches mm -hmm. on what we're talking about right here, right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Um, but, so yeah, go just ahead. As, a, as a quick uh, thing, I think that um, the same argument could be made for order, essentially, from those people who value these things differently. And I think that if we take chaos, not necessarily in the literal, literal biblical meaning, but uh, uncontrolled action, uh, this is a, mu a much more soft way of framing it. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there needs to be an understanding that there will be uncontrolled action. That's not evil in and of itself. It's uh, when an inappropriate amount of uncontrolled action is in introduced to the system uh, that it becomes much more um, understandable from sort of Petersonian position, right? I, I would I would put this uh, this way as a Christian. There will always be places in the universe mm -hmm. where God's gaze does not fall, but it is completely. Which is to say, there will always be chaos. Wait, wait, in the I, how does that how does that square with God's omnipotence? Well, it 
because God can God can choose not to can, God can hide his face away as the Hebrews oh, okay. would say. Okay, okay, okay. Right. Uh, but but I I believe very firmly in my soul that although these places will always exist and human souls may find themselves temporarily in these places, it is completely evil for a human to desire that. And so humans' desire should always be towards order, even though they may experience chaos out of necessity. And we could argue over what role that will play in a non-fallen state of humanity. But that's, that's how another discussion for us to have. Okay, yeah, that's way too big. Yeah, that's huge, but I like yeah, it. I like it. We we have before us in this discussion over the role of chaos in metaphysics. The, this is what's so funny about Warhammer is it was created by British history nerds. So they took mm. all of these philosophical questions and they wove them into their own imagery, I mean, which is I why love, I always. I I, yeah, which is why and this is the, what Morgoth said about Warhammer is it was so good in the 80s because it was created by British history nerds. But now what you see is the franchise falling into the hands of people who just like Warhammer for Warhammer. Yeah. Uh, so another discussion. Yeah. Uh, I have to get through these super chats, though. Timo Naro for $3. What does Sargon, what do Sargon and Dave think about destiny? Oh, my God, another controversial topic. We could probably talk as much about that as we could talk about chaos. Think, uh, he's, he's my favorite bread tuber. <laughs> Even if we disagree a lot with his politics, he seems to at least self-regulate and has not purity spiraled. For example, Vosh or Demon Mama. Well, I'll say this about Destiny. Destiny is an actual... Destiny is an actual... As Gertrude Stein would say, or not say, there is there there with Destiny. Destiny is an actual... He's his own man. Yeah. Uh, Vosh and Demon Mama are a copy of destiny and demon mommy as a copy of a copy of destiny. And, and so I consider a boss to be more of a force than a person. Destiny's main mistake is that he just basically reflects the cathedral back at itself. And to me, that's not, I, I don't consider that very useful. You know, he, he likes to be contrarian towards the right for the sake of being contrarian rather than having a well thought out position against right wing positions. Um, and it, it's easy for him to fall back into the cathedral's narrative about anything really. Uh, because obviously a lot of work has already been done for him to construct that narrative. Well, that's because um, his MO is like his MO is to quote like the the studies and all that. That's the destiny stereotype, right? But although he doesn't do that so much anymore, actually, I've got to say. Okay, well, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I haven't he, been. I don't, I don't follow him tremendously closely, but I actually do quite like Destiny. Um, you know, generally. I mean, he is amazing at arguing with the left. You've got to give him his credit. He is really good at thrashing them uh, on their own terms. So, you know, good job there, basically. Um, yeah, Destiny is but, good. At, yeah. He, well, he, he definitely, for some reason, they listen to him. I, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it's because they view him as one of their own, right? And, uh, like, they, he, he's come out of them and then turned this, you know, gaze back on them and they don't like it. And it's great. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's just. You know, you know, you know. There's a person who I feel. Um, there's always people who I don't have good reasons to dislike, but I kind of dislike. One of them is Yoram Harzoni, uh, who's a very good man and someone who I should like, but uh, ticks me off the wrong way. Um, a person who I have reasons to dislike, who reminds me of Destiny a lot, is Stephen Pinker. Um, and oh, uh, why do we why do we dislike Stephen Pinker? <laughs> I feel. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I do. I uh, mm. when I was a new atheist, he was my favorite guy. Mm. Uh, I feel that he sees the problem that I'm looking at, and he does not uh, have skin in the game. I feel that he, uh, I, I feel, and I'm, I can't really mention a lot of these scandals because they involve possible scientific results that are not season friendly. But I felt right. that he um, left. Uh, a prominent scientist out to dry uh, for speaking some uh, speaking on a truth that he himself spoke on in previous lectures, and mm. um, yeah, James Watson to be particular, and uh, oh, the, what the discovery of DNA? Well, that, yeah. So James Watson was um, uh, he that was the guy? yeah, but yeah, the discoverer of DNA because he, he it, talked about um, uh, the no no uh, yes. You know, the no-no subject. Statistical differences between demographic mm. groups, yeah. the potential for that being the case, which we cannot, I think so, a reasonable uh, examination has to hold up <laughs> as a possibility. Uh, uh, Stephen Pinker uh, has written- Susan, and, I disavow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stephen Pinker has written and spoken on that. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the problem here is that once you realize that, that, that this is, um, that prominent scientists are being smacked down for this, 
and, and, and Steven Pinker, he can't see this and, 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 and ignore it and then, and, and let other scientists get thrown under the bus and then lecture me about how I should trust the science. Like, I can't do that, yeah. Steven Pinker. Like, yeah. once I see this, you have to acknowledge that science has been corrupted. And Steven Pinker has never acknowledged that something fundamentally has been politically corrupted inside the realm of science. And he, he acknowledges it in peace, but then he just drives around the entire thing. And the same thing is true with Destiny. Destiny, he has to acknowledge that something foundationally has been corrupted. But the problem is, in order to do that, he has to acknowledge that something about what the right wing is saying is correct. And neither Pinker nor Destiny wants to take that step. And and that's why I'm always like, I, I applaud them for their yeoman's work against arguing against the crazier half of the left. But then I'm like, okay, well, I, I feel something about them intellectually. I feel it as gentlemen, they should be inclined to, to, to sort of go to war with this stuff rather than just sort of critique it and then scurry back to the safe realm of, of, of basically yeah, the tribe. Yeah, exactly. Of, of, yeah. of, of yeah. dumping on right wingers who, who, who kind of, mm. because the right wingers go like, not only are you wrong, I bet you're fundamentally corrupted. And, yeah. and because of that, we ask, uncomfortable questions uh and that and, and and you know come to uncomfortable conclusions and i feel that destiny and pinker like taking pot shots at people who are kind of in the mud so to speak of that process intellectually hmm. um and and i i'm sure destiny is a great i mean he he certainly is one, a very good debater <laughs> oh he's it's his bread and butter and i yeah. Like he's funny as well, you know. He's got a good sense of humor, and I, I do genuinely quite like him actually. Like even though I've got lots of reasons why I shouldn't, uh, but I, I kind of got a soft sort of a soft spot for him. I would say you know? uh, he's he's an excellent esport athlete. Yes, I'm <laughs> <laughs> uh, doing the the the, the um. Uh, th yeah. That's sort of an inside joke about racism, <laughs> but um, but I, I should I shouldn't shut up. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Ori Samsonov just gives a donation. Love your conversations. Please do this more often. Well, thank you. I do it once a week these days. Um, Norm Kelly for five dollars says English should go back to speaking old English. Ugh. Um, we 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 can't even think about going back to using pre decimal money. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many shillings to a groat or whatever it was so. or uh, but but um I, I think uh one thing i will say is that um i don't know what this uh, this accent i've been told is called perceived pronunciation uh, but uh i think philosophy tube has whenever somebody whenever a british person speaks exactly like philosophy tube i i immediately turn my brain off and i don't know who, who's churning out people who speak like that it speaks like someone who's been churned out of drama school in particular uh, I, well, I don't philosophy know. tube is a product of drama school, so. Okay, and uh, but but I was listening to um, I think it was the Princess Bride, and there was an actor yeah. who spoke like that, and I'm like, oh my god, I can't, I can't, I can't. It Princess just, Bride's it's, great though, man. Well, it's a good movie, right? But yeah. it sort of gets ruined by these things, right? Uh, retroactively. I mean, I I don't know about uh, philosophy tube. I thought it was from York or something like that. Some of the well, he does not speak with a York accent, though. Well, that's the thing. So you can tell that this is an accent he's acquired through his dramatics. Uh, but no, he was he's a drama school person, uh, as far as I understand it. Yeah. Uh, although I'll say this about Middle English. Um, I I every time someone rolls out that thing about gender to me about gender not meaning anything about sex. I always like flip open my copy of Canterbury Tales. Canterbury Tales contains the uh, one of the first uh, English words of gender, right? And it's and it's very very famous intro, right? When oh, Chaucer okay. said I'm, Yeah, he I, says I, I, the 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 rain and gender is the flowers, right? Uh, oh, really? Yeah, I believe that he uses those words, right? right. Um, I, I'm not doubting it. It's been many years since I've read anything from Chaucer. So I would have to I'd have to go back and check. I should go I should really do a do a rereading, shouldn't I? Yeah, um yeah, I, I it's I believe it's that very famous prologue that they always make you um uh yeah, the uh yeah, it's a, of which veritu engendereth the flower. That's the yeah. hmm. when April with its shores of sote, uh the, the droughts of March have proved to the root, yeah, whatever. It's um, I'm not terribly cultured. I'll have to go and read it. 
I had a uh, British uh, history uh, professor in high school that made us memorize that in Middle English. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I actually spent a, a year in England uh, in British schools when I was a child, which was a great experience. I, I, I realized that the first unit you get in British history is William the Conqueror and not anything earlier. Yeah. <laughs> it's no, like no. you're Columbus. <laughs> uh, well, kind of, yeah. And that, that is true. I mean, you, you do, I'm sure we did something about the anglo saxons I'm sure you did something about Alfred the Great. Um, but the the pre Norman conquest is quite uh, misty in the <laughs> general English understanding. We understand that oh it was Anglo Saxons and then you know William the Conqueror and then Henry the Eighth and then British Empire and then World War Two basically. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then and then we defeated Hitler and, and conquered yeah. the world or whatever. And everything was great for all time. <laughs> then history stopped. <laughs> yes, yes. Then history stopped. That's exactly it. Yeah, that's basically it. And, and it will never happen again. Yes. That, that's one of the, that's yeah. one reason why boys hate history is that they, they think that they're not involved in it. Right. And so, yeah, totally. And totally. one of the reasons why we all like Warhammer 40 K is that it, you, you can very physically imagine history happening in the future. You, and, you know, that's exactly right. Cause I, when I was in school, I found history terribly boring because all I really remember about it was world war two, you know, and world war one endless muddy trenches but underpinning it was the don't worry this will never be you right yeah. so you don't have to worry about this and so look at the boring thing that happened in the black and white pictures of bodies and trenches and you're like oh, god that's that's terrible and it was only it was only like after i left school that i like found like classical history where you're you're very in the moment when you're reading plutarch or you know herodotus or whatever you know you are with alexander on the anabasis through persia you know you're not you're not like some remote viewer you're there it, you, stuff is going on and things are exciting and what you do matters and you're you're a part of the thing and suddenly i, I love history now you know and uh, you know how they can ruin it for you in school but i think that's exactly it. you're not it's not going to happen to you so don't worry about it so, so what you're saying sargon is we have to go from history isn't happening to history is happening and it's a good thing oh yeah oh yeah no 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 we we need to honestly you could you could get young men interested in history by literally just taking them, beginning, begin with classical history. Just begin with Alexander or Caesar and be like, this awesome stuff happened. And then this is why, like, you know, with Elizabeth or with, you know, Edward or whatever, you, you can nail it into them and they will feel themselves as being a part of that history. You, you're exactly right. It's World War II. The way that it's taught, this happened once and it will never happen again. Mm -hmm. That was the thing. That was the thing. Although for older, uh, that, that would be great for high schoolers, but for older college people, um, I think that the best history is art history uh, because you're so skeptical as a college student that it, it's, it's important to have your understanding of history anchored to actual like physical things. I don't know, hmm. um, uh, but I have to go on. Uh, so Glow in the Dark says for $3, did you hear that the World Economic Forum and the UN are planning to speed up the 2030 climate incentives. Do you think that this is a response to Trump maybe coming back? Well, I didn't hear that specific thing about the UN's 2030 goals, but I can't turn on any piece of media without getting flooded by climate change stuff. So I figured that somebody in the positions of the Cathedral Power Center was uh, um, ramping up the let's panic about climate change knob. Are you hearing that in Britain too? Oh, it's constant, nonstop climate propaganda. And it's obvious that this is coordinated. Uh, and it's obvious that the essentially, I think what they had was a, a um, essentially like a, a hand, a deck of cards, and they had a hand. And they were like, right, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna use what they believe to be strong mimetic incentives that will get the masses moving in one direction or another to get them to do what they want without having to impose truly draconian tyrannies on people and climate is the final one i think i think this is the the, the one that it because it's the trump card right you're you going to destroy anything. the earth you yeah know? like it doesn't get any bigger than this you're saving the planet it's like you're not saving the fucking planet you're bob from you know chipping them shut up bob you know you <laughs> get you know you're not you're not saving the fucking planet but now bob can be part of this greta thunberg narrative and it it's fucking artificial but I think it's the last and biggest one that they have. It's a, it's a big one because it justifies pretty much anything in perpetuity. Totally. It's a problem that can never be solved. And 
what's so funny is that the left is making sure it can't be solved by nuking literally all of our best options. Yeah. Um, and uh, the the it it just does anything. I guess the only problem is I don't think that anyone really people really believed in COVID. It's the number of people who really believe in global warming the way that people really believed in COVID that I've ever met, I probably could count on two hands. Yeah. They, they, I mean? Cause I mean, people, yeah, absolutely. Cause people believing in COVID was those losers in their cars on their own with the mask. Like that's somebody who really believes in COVID. You're on your own in a car and you're still wearing the fucking mask, but the climate change people will still use planes. They still use their cars. They still mm. engage in the thing they claim is destroying the planet. It's like, well, why the hell are you doing it then? You know, it's not a, it's not a sincere belief. It is theoretical to them. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, there's something cringe about that. I really hate it. Yeah. I'm sure that for some people it's a sincere belief, but it's, it's weird. It's very few. I haven't very, very few. I mean, all the climate activists use private jets, don't they? So it's like, okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, the COVID activists at least wore their masks, you know, <laughs> they at least wore their masks, got their vaccines. I'm a Californian, so I can remember when the left-wing environmentalists were hippies, as opposed to technocratic busybodies. And I really miss the hippies. Oh yeah. I mean, I really, I, I don't like that movement, but I, the, 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 our new class of technocratic, globe-trotting busybodies is a real downgrade. And it, it seems less like a, a real threat. <laughs> like yeah, a threat to my livelihood. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just thinking. I'm actually. I was. I was. I was just thinking that they organically live their religion. And yeah, yeah, I can't. I can't hate anybody who organically lives their religion. Well, I don't know. Maybe if your religion's like pedophilia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, yeah. But, but like, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like for someone who's like, we should, we should save the planet and live in the live in the woods, and they go and live in the woods. Okay, fine. You know. Yeah, I, it's obvious that they're trying to ramp. I, I really don't think that this 2030 agenda is anything other than an artificial marker. I don't think that that the the leader, maybe you agree with me on this, I don't think the leaders genuinely think that they have to get something done by 2030. I think they wheel that out as something that the activists can salivate over. Uh, but all, all they're concerned about is that in this moment, the narrative is this way and not that. I really think that our leaders at the global stage are like the ultimate short-term thinkers. Completely. Like they, this, they're, they're, they're just lurching from crisis to crisis and grabbing as much power as they can with each one. Um, mm. This is why, this is why I was saying about the Democrats, like they, they, you can feel the stench of desperation on them. Like they, they don't have a long-term plan at this point. They're lurching from, from like staggering from move position to position desperately trying to retain the hegemony they've got and i think it can't last do you know what i want to know i want to know what they're actually afraid of i think they might have a better well no i miss what i'm saying to you uh Zargon, carl sorry uh i feel like they have a better vision of how we beat them than we do oh of course they do they know <laughs> they know all their deepest darkest flaws and secrets uh, but yeah. yeah what 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 does nancy pelosi fear you know, yeah, she doesn't care about racism. Fuck off. She doesn't no, care about but, climate change. She's not going to live long enough. Like, what does she really fear? Yeah, what is what does she really think is going to happen to unseat yeah. her power? Certainly, her stock portfolio is not. It's got to be Epstein, right? It's got to be connected to Epstein. It, it's it's kind of it's kind of funny because my wife is um her 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 parents are more like they're Canadian, so they're not like Republicans, but they're kind of more like normie cons, right? And right, right. um and so like. You, I get a chance to peer into sort of the Republican imagination when, when I never grew up with it. And um, Republican, the Republican imagination is just dominated by like these small little scandals that will never change anything. Like Nancy Pelosi's husband got a DUI or something like that. Like that's not going to change anything, right? <laughs> the probability well, that he'll suffer consequences for that are close to zero. Yeah. <laughs> well, obviously it's totally zero. Yeah. You know, even if he got fine, he's well, well enough off to pay it. Uh, and, and, and the Nancy Pelosi's portfolio is just, uh, oh, that's, that's gangbusters. Yeah. yeah that's, um, Novum for $25. Good afternoon, gentlemen. I just wanted to thank the distributist 
God, I wish I didn't name that my channel that. I wanted to thank the distributor test again. My channel's called Sargon, all right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I didn't even think about it when I fucking named my channel. But like, if I thought I was going to become famous, I would just have called myself Carl. You know? Yeah. Because <laughs> it was my it was my Steam tag. Like me and a friend, we used to, you know, he he was yeah. Gilgamesh, I'm Sargon, and we just played video games. It was just, you know, that's what you did like 15 years ago on the internet because it was nothing important and i didn't even think about it Fuck yeah. sake. I, I wasn't aware when i called myself the distributist that gk tetraton was such a um icon of sort of like the, the midwit catholic crowd like it's oh, a really? stereo, yeah it's a stereotype like of a, cer a certain type of american catholic in particular that they're like really into gk chesterton and Sar and and c.s lewis and don't get me wrong they're, they're brilliant authors and i love them but it's sort of like um uh, sort of like being a, uh, a millennial woman who's into Harry Potter. Uh, it's it's yeah. just like you're you're playing right into the Nina Jankowicz uh, stereotype, uh, but but for you know Catholic uh, men of the same age. Uh, so Novum for US twenty five dollars. Um, if the right is able to create, uh, is to create them oh, walkable communities. I, I wanted to ask them about walkable communities. If the right is able to create walkable communities where the youth can come into their own and gain real social skills, instead of being needlessly sheltered, we'll be able to, tra um, we'll be able to get a track on raising lions instead of foxes again. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I agree with your use of the foxes versus lions distinction. I think, is that Spengler? I, I, or is it maybe a vola? I can't remember. Valley. Oh, is it Machiavelli? Yeah, f fundamentally. Okay. Uh, you've got to be a lion to scare away the wolves and a fox to avoid the traps. Oh, yeah, I remember that. But there was some more modern thinker that there used is, that yeah, more prominently. Yeah, I can't remember. It was one of the, it was one of the 20th century people. Um, but he was quoting, references it all the time. Yeah. yeah um, but this is actually something that I've been thinking a lot about. Uh, you, you know, AA, I kind of had a, an abortive attempt to do that. this when I had more time. Uh, but but AI was able to launch this more properly with his basket weaving project. Uh, but this idea that, and I, I, I def definitely share this, that creating in real life um, communities, or this person is saying walkable communities, but it's the same idea. This is where the right wing can really excel in a way that the left wing cannot. And uh, I don't know, I'd like to hear your opinion on that. I think that the uh, distinguish between the old and the young is part of the problem. Um, the young are stupid, and they don't know what they're doing, and they should be guided by the older men. Mm -hmm. And so the older men should... I mean, on, honestly, right, uh, the, I, I love to bring this up, but War Games Clubs are actually a great example of this, uh, where it's somewhere that young men can go uh, to learn how a structure is upheld and maintained because of the older men who run it, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you actually learn how the thing should be done, uh, and it's something accessible that young men will want to do. It's very nerdy, obviously, but, um, but it's, a, it's a good example of it in practice, you know? Um, and so, essentially, these kind of um, public apprenticeships, in a way, mm -hmm. is, you know, we should look at it. Like, we shouldn't think, right, we'll leave the youth to it, and they'll figure it out themselves. No, 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 no. We should set up the things that we want them to come into and show them how it's done, basically. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that the millennials should be thinking about themselves in terms of mentorship. Um, mm. This is one of the things I, I God, there's so many different conversations we could be having. Uh, but but what you're saying about millennials not having a tragedy to to fully live their their lives on. I think that I think that millennials' great acts of heroism are going to come after they're forty. I think that once that's well, well, that will be so. <laughs> that that's that will be that will be where they they encounter their personal tragedy in their lives and their ability to process that will be will be uh, there that will be the 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 moment of hardship and crisis that will allow them to speak about reality again and so at the point where they're bringing something culturally meaningful into existence a lot of it's going to be through the the process of mentorship of new people I, the, su the suffering, the, the the millennial suffering is yet to come, right? It's on the horizon. Like the question is, somewhat you you always suffer at some point. When is the millennial going to suffer? And it's like, well, the millennial woman at least is going to suffer when she's about fifty. That's when she's going to suffer, 
I think, no I think it started to... actually. I think we started it. I think. Uh, yeah, but wait, but the, yeah, but no, it's really going to kick in when no one cares about an old single woman, right? I'm mm -hmm. sorry, I'm not trying to be rude or anything like that, but no one wants to have sex with you. You don't have any children to look after. You aren't like competitive in the workplace like the men are. Like no one cares. You've got nothing. You you are you are going to find out what true loneliness really feels like. You're gonna find out. You know, you won't even be able to get laid, and it's going to be terrible. Um, it's it, That's what genuine suffering is going to be for the, for the millennial women. Millennials heroism will come when they come to terms with the fact that they don't matter in any sense, and or yeah. none of us matter in any sense, right? And yeah. this is obviously very hard for us on the YouTube channels. But what, one thing I actually like about you, Carl, is that, like, you always have maintained this sort of groundedness to you know and that's really i think been one of your utility it, like i don't think it, un, unlike a lot of these streamer phenomenons like i feel contrapoints really has been devoured by their own fame they feel trapped by it it feels like they're a genuine person trying to get out of the body of a famous person or a famous phenomenon and i always felt that you know, one of the utilities maybe us on the right could pursue i'm not saying either of us have achieved it is that you know we understand that like you know we're we're just ordinary people here doing ordinary stuff. And I've and, got I've got to tell you, man, when when you've got a lot of people all saying the same thing to you, it's very hard to remember that. It's very yeah. very hard to remember that. Like it it's it like I just think back to a couple of years ago. I'm thinking, wow, I was in a very strange place. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's a very very strange world, and you've got to be careful. <laughs> I liked your idea of the wargaming groups. I kind of got sucked into that a little bit in 2020. Uh, I apologize. But, yeah, it's good. Uh, well, it was a dad hobby, and you know, yeah. then I then I moved, and, and none of the dads in the area played it, so it was I uh, kind of fell by the wayside. Um, uh, but uh, the one thing I kind of hoped to bring back uh, was folk music because that's one of my things. I really truly believe that if we could uh, read, it, it, this is something that could bring atheists and Christians together is embracing our musical tradition. Now I know as an English person, that's like uh, of all the strength in England, that's probably the weakest dimension of it. Um, yeah, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> I can thank Tom you can know, thank all right. Right. Oh, for that one. <laughs> I, I'm not saying I, I, I accept the criticism. I accept it. There, there are more English ballads surviving in America than there are in England. Thanks to Oliver Cromwell. Oh, no, don't doubt. Uh, and yeah, that, that's a lot of the Appalachian music is that, um, yeah. but, uh, uh, but, uh, the, where was I going with it? I, I always personally hope that that would be something that we could bring back, but I'm sure, you know, you have some pet projects of your own that you wouldn't. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, I don't even know it. it like, I, I think that what we have to do is not try to be, uh, too hands on with this idea as in like. You know, let let people do what they want, but as long as you make them understand that they should be doing it together, the older generation and the younger generation, the older generation should be stewarding the younger generation. You know, because this this twentieth century mindset that like, oh every generation rebels, it's like no, it never used to be this way because yeah. the older generation was spending their time with the younger generation, and when the old generation was like right, go play, go do something, I don't give a fuck, that was the problem. No, 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 you spend your time with the young people. You know, and they'll they'll be glad that you did, and that's the continuity of civilization right there. That's brilliant. I mean, this is something that uh, so you may know um, Alex Kishuda, and she had Angela Nagel on. Another, I know oh, yeah. you've talked to them per personally. I discovered she Angela Nagel. She was really nice, actually. She was really nice. Oh yeah, I imagine. I mean, she's super based now, um, yeah. and uh, yeah. she's on Alex Kishuda, and she said, uh, you know, one of these the things about is that you can't motivate yourself to want to become a parent if your job is just to raise autonomous decultured individuals yes. uh, the idea of the family is that there's some intergenerational carryover and path and life that we're all participating in mm -hmm. and, and and if we're in this uh place of eternal rebellion that can't really take root mm -hmm. and um and i don't know the this is almost too big of a conversation to have for a super chat, but uh, I'll have to go on. But, um, but I, de I definitely think it's an important thing to put a pin in and come back to. Yeah. I mean, it's like all of these things. Uh, if you don't know of uh, Alex Kishida, um, she has a great podcast interviewing people. I, 
I don't think she's interviewed you, and that's amazing, actually. No, but, I've never heard of her. Uh, I mean, if you want to get, uh, pass my email address or something, I'm happy oh, yeah, to yeah. say uh, hi. Okay, yeah, I don't know if I, I probably have a, the, your old email address. <laughs> uh, yeah, she, she's, yeah. she's an interview uh, podcast, but she's, um, you know, she's interviewed like a, a lot of people. And uh, yeah, I definitely ha um, think you'd have a good time with uh, interviewing with her. Um, mm -hmm. Going on, Antimatter Bone Crusher for $3 USA. Uh, following up on the primacy of ordered hierarchy over universal equality and meritocracy as a crystallizing principle now become the rights greatest or strongest weapon against diversity, equality, and intersectionality. Well, we've already, we've already touched on this a, a little bit, um, but, but just to comment on this, I think that if, if the right becomes properly ordered, all this DEI stuff is going to um, look really, yeah. really weak in comparison. Yeah. Uh, I, I still have a wage cuck job and so does everyone in my family. And um, maybe you're not aware of this, Sargon, but like there are new like commissariat offices that are opening up in most technology companies where there never were before under the purview of that. diversity. Like this is like a real thing that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. It's cancer. It's, it's amazing. I, I, it, some, some anthropologists, if we still had honest anthropologists, would be completely going berserk over this ability to observe this new human development in action. Although I think well, that the person's named Jonathan Haidt, but <laughs> it's it's just a new religion that's setting up its chapels in the in the places of work. There's nothing new. Uh, it's just this is what it looks like in the modern era. Yes, yeah, Arkham, but this wasn't supposed to happen because history was over. <laughs> uh, Great point. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So Sam one five three for ten dollars. The Republicans are such cucks that New York congressman was almost killed and it seemed like a moot point now. He's now making a rambling about changing the felony bail law. Dude, your political opponents almost killed you. There's going to, they're going to face a lot of fortification this fall. Uh, I maybe missed this story. Was there an assassination attempt? Yeah, no, the, a, a chap uh, was incited by a Democrat politician to try and stab the Republican contender for their seat. I can't remember whereabouts it was, but uh, the, I, I saw a segment on Tucker York, Carlson yeah. about this, actually. I was in New York, right? Okay. Yeah. I saw Tucker Carlson interviewing the guy. And um, yeah, I mean, the, this this is not new. Like, you know, Kavanaugh, the guy who was going to assassinate Kavanaugh, this has happened plenty of times. Like, the Democrats are playing for keeps, right? They are, they are okay when their extremist rhetoric causes attempted murder they're okay with that they're fine with that they you know so just be aware basically yeah well i mean it's hard to know exactly i mean i'm sure you heard this from Aaron mcintyre but uh, mm. i feel like Aaron mcintyre has really taken like he's taken the reins for the political side so i want to move in more of a cultural direction yeah. um but but he he, he he said this multiple times no one in america believes in democracy anymore like this is you know this is one of the reasons why uh, you know i'm a very tepid if i am a monarchist i'm a very tepid one uh which is why it's kind of funny for to be pigeonholed by that but um i this is one of the reasons why i think a lot of people are increasingly at home with the idea of of, uh, of anti-democratic ideas is because it's a very transparent that no one believes in it anymore or no one I believes think, in democracy i think that there are lots of people who do like normies um but they, they it doesn't matter that they do because half of your political, half your political society, the those people actively involved in politics, uh, you know, full half of those don't, and they don't care. They yeah. will, they will cheer when a Democrat activist murders a Republican politician. They'll cheer for it. Uh, the Republicans are waking up to that, and now they're going to become radicalized in the same way. So if a Republican activist murders a Democrat politician, they'll be like. Pfft get what you deserve yeah. mate. don't care you know and so you are right in that regard but like there is the vast majority of normies who don't necessarily see or engage with this and so they do uh they probably just don't realize how bad things have got frankly but yeah no it's it's clear that the democrats are radicalizing to not care about the, well they would call it stochastic terrorism the, to incite it and that's what they're doing but that means increasingly that uh, giving lip service to dem dem democracy is like wearing masks. It's something we're doing to humor the boomers and then, you know, yes. we're going to take it off. Yeah, that's, 
they're no longer relevant, right? But, but um, this was what a social contract society was destined to dissolve into. Uh, uh, two warring factions who will stick to the rules as long as they can bend it in their favor when they're in power. So <laughs> We need some kind of Frederick the Great or whatever. Uh, um, uh, glow in the dark for USA $10. The Democratic coalition is cracking. That is why they are desperate. Threats of excommunication is losing its effect. People are being forced to pick their kids and their politics, are forced between are forced to pick their kids and their politics. Um, between them, he means. Between them, I think, yeah. yeah. Too many choose politics, but instinct is still strong outside leftist strongholds. Most can't throw their kids off the cliff yet. Yep. Uh, he's, he's right. He's right. This is true to a certain extent, but it's very difficult to know how much this is ultimately going to mean. Dived in the wool, religious people will, will usually pick their religion over their children, except in certain very extreme cases. Mm. And uh, it's usually not put in, in that way. Um, uh, the question is, 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 the, is the demographic coalition for the left going to hold together? Uh, it, it seems, at least in is. America, in America, it looks like the Hispanics are way softer than yeah. the Democrats previously thought. Yeah. And I, I, I guess that we always knew this. We always knew that, uh, that, that, that the Democrats, Catholics, yeah. the Catholic Hispanics weren't actually progressive radicals. eh? weird. Yeah. Well, I mean, th what they were imagining were that the Hispanics would be sort of African Americans, yeah. but Racial slightly activists. softer. Yeah. And this is not, going to be the case but the problem is that neither is it going to be the case that uh hispanics are going to become a, a, a coalition member in a strong way for the republicans they most likely are going to be a swing demographic and i'm an i'm an elitist at not not prescriptively but descriptively and so i believe that coalitions and reigning coalitions are really determined not by the swing uh parties but by the um but by the, the, the ones that 100% always vote for the same side, which is why Catholics are, you know, if you look demographically, Catholics always decide the election and mm -hmm. who cares? And I'm, I'm, I, my primary identity is Catholic. And if, my, if I were ever told to give advice to a presidential campaign, it would be ignore Catholics because they just blow in the direction of the wind. I mean, I'm serious, right? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. You, you, in, 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 yeah. in real politics, you do not get power for being kind of wishy-washy, I move with opinion polls. You get power yeah. by by powering a coalition and making sure that that coalition is ascendant. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that's why the African-American community is a very politically powerful coalition in America, even though it's done almost nothing for them. Uh, they're, they're one of the most um, poorly served communities, even though <laughs> In Machiavellian terms, that coalition decides a lot of political power and a lot of, yeah, yeah. or I should say, their leaders decide a lot of the direction. Um, it's all perception, isn't it? Because I mean, like, what percentage of the black community actually votes? You know, it can't uh, be like a massive number of them. Votes, or I mean, no, it actually goes out to the polls, right, and actually fills the thing. Like, you know, are we are we literally talking about you know gangbangers going down and voting Democrat? You know. It, like what percentage of the African of, of the thirteen percent actually goes to the polls? It can't be that many. But but in in the same way that that's an irrelevant question though because it's like what Elon Musk said about uh, Joe Biden. It doesn't matter what the majority of African Americans vote for. What it matters is who speaks for them. In the well, same no, way that it, it doesn't it doesn't matter what Joe Biden thinks. It just matters what appears in his teleprompter. Well, no, that's and what so, I mean. Like it, it, it's it's a sort of uh, like this is what I mean. It's the perception of the thing. Right? Yeah, yeah. Is, it is not because, like, it's it. If it was like you know, here's a quarter of the electorate and ninety five percent of them voted. So getting their vote on board, that's a really solid block. That's not what this is about. This is about like genuflecting on several different layers of politics. You know, you've got like different strands that tie together to the African American community, but that is actually not a tremendously solid political core of its own. Is what I mean. Is what I'm trying to yeah. say. I mean, in some ways, the African American community is, is uh, oh, I don't know if I want to take pot shots at other members of my no, right wing no, no, coalition, no. but but no, I mean, what I'm saying is it is a it's a it's a case against ethno nationalism because there's a difference between 
having an ethnic coalition hold power and having power actually accrue to their benefit. Mm. And the African-Americans are the perfect example of this. There's an enormous amount of power that's up for grabs uh, based on uh, being the, the, the person who can tell you what the African-American community wants. Yeah. And yet almost none of that power has ever been put to the actual uh, betterment or, or the actual um, uplift the people of, of the people. don't get it. Like there's so much money, there's so much cap like political capital. And you see the black activists saying this all the time. It's like, where's our fucking money? Why isn't any of this translating into goods for our community? Well, that's a great question. Well, goods for the community, what the African-American community needs more than anything else is it needs the ability uh, to transmit internet intergenerational wealth. And that's what it doesn't have, right? It doesn't, it, it, the African-American community does not have the, the, the ability to hold capital. And the most visible way it doesn't have this is what's the, what's the number one institution that most middle-class uh, uh, people have that holds Homeship. capital? Well, Homeship. I was going to say families. Oh. Right. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Okay, but that's what profit, home, homes being transmitted through family connections. Yes. Yeah, and so like this is, I mean, in some sense, this was the original Bush administration idea was that we're going to uh, make everyone homeowners, even though they might not be able to pay their mortgage, which is not, but so the necessary footwork hadn't been done before then. But you know, uh, this you are is right. It's the, the continuation of the family is the most important thing uh, for, yeah. for any community, really. Yeah, and, and when you look at the African American community, you'll see all these holes, and so they can, mm. all of this activist money can be put into their them, and then it flows right out into the activist community well, again. But I've been saying this about reparations for years. It's like, okay, well, you know, give each African American a million dollars, and see how much money they have the following year. And the answer is they have zero. They'll be in exactly the same position as where they started. But whoever makes luxury cars and amazing shoes, they'll be millions of dollars richer. There you go. And what the, what the sad thing about it is, is that um, this in in a hundred years, the the white community will be in the exact same position they are yeah. based on the trends we're experiencing, right? Oh, yeah. and, and we're being trained as a people to be in that position because. The, the kind of people that can receive a million dollars and then lose it are exactly the kind of people that the oligarchs can control. And that's why everyone is being trained to do that in the modern world. And the African-American community were just the most vulnerable to that attack in the 20th century. They're just they, the they first people the, to catch this disease. They are the natural constituency of the WEF. You'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Well, you'll definitely own nothing. <laughs> definitely. You know? <laughs> you, and you'll be high on drugs okay that's yeah. that's the happy part i, I hate to say it, but, whatever you are to be happy <laughs> yeah it, i hate to say it, but uh, it's nearly 10 o'clock so i think i'm gonna have to go all right um, well okay cool um yeah uh, i'm on my but, last uh, yeah okay let's let's uh, sorry if you've got a couple more we'll we'll, we'll we'll blast through the last couple okay two more super chats guys no more super chats Sergeant has to go uh glow in the dark says has socialism died has communism died and is there institution that does not need wait as long as there are are institutions that don't need results of the woke uh that don't need to get results the woke will be around i think communism and socialism have died i agree with that right no they 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 will be with us as long as the enlightenment is with us but that's a big conversation i'm not gonna i'm not gonna yeah. i'm not even gonna explain myself <laughs> Uh, I, I will take the opposite position and not argue it. I think that capitalism and socialism are both fake and both gay. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I stole that from Yarvin, so uh, I can't conclude. But yeah, not, they're both not fake. even wrong. Yeah, yeah, it, it's not. It, it, if, yeah. if you're thinking in terms of capitalism versus socialism, you're not thinking in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, use Aristotle's categories; they're much more robust. Um, Dreadnought for $25 USA. This is the last one, Sargon. Um, uh, good to see the two of uh, my favorite YouTubers talking together. Have some beer on me, Dave. It would be fun if you could talk with Lauren Southern sometime about her experiences on the distant right. Also, the feeling I get from our leaders is that they intend to plunder the country to destitution, then fly to a bunker in New Zealand. Uh, oh, yeah. Sargon, can you comment on that? Uh, it was nice to know. I mean, <clears throat> so Lauren Southern's documentary, right? 
it was short fat otaku messaging me on discord going oh my god look at this and i hadn't watched it i was just like i'm not in it and i knew i wasn't in it because i haven't done anything fucking wrong and uh <laughs> it's, it's the easiest way to know that you're okay it's just not screw people over just don't screw people over i just don't go around screw people over i you know it's just the easiest way to be okay and it's so much easier than covering up your tracks it's so much easier than any of the other things just just be sincere and good-hearted and try and do the right thing and just earn your money legitimately and your life will just be so much easier um but yeah no lauren seems fine you know like it seems it seems like it was a boil that needed to be burst so i i don't do drama and i was never really yeah. into that scene so it's an awful scene it's yeah. awful I, I'm, I'm really glad that we, as the distant right, are so we're so much different than we were in 2016, mm -hmm. and I, I'm encouraged by the direction we're going. But uh, I have a, uh, a, a something I need to take uh, attend to myself. So with that, Sargon, I think I just want to thank you very much for coming on uh, the channel, and hopefully we'll be able to chase another one of these uh, many topics we talked about in passing. No, no, I'd, I'd, I'd love to because the great thing about this is like uh, I've watched a bunch of your streams so I know where you are thought wise and so I, I it was easy for me to gel what I was thinking into what you've already laid out so like in a month or two's time if you want to do another one I would love to absolutely oh. I had a great time yeah absolutely let's uh let's let's have another one sometime and I hope you have a great rest of the afternoon uh, uh well it's 10 o'clock at night so <laughs> I'm gonna go finish oh. off my thousand suns and uh, <laughs> then get a bed <laughs> Well, I, I'm I, right I, at the end, so you know, I really want to get them done. I, I, I'm not going to lie. I am actually, I actually more avidly consume your your mini painting content on Instagram. I think I've, <laughs> I think that's been my. Uh, but but you're you're a better. Um, if I I I, I have kind of gotten out of the hobby a little bit, but mm. uh, you're doing a pretty good job, I have to say. Well, I think I'm really working hard on the painting of it. Actually, it's it, it, it's taking a lot of time because like I I, I want to get the, the a thousand points so I can actually play a few battles. But the thing is, like each one takes forever to paint because they're such detailed models. They're beautiful. And then I've I've set a really high standard for myself now. So it's like right, okay, now I have to keep going and and, and mm -hmm. so it's taking forever. But I'm I've really worked on it. You know, I watched a bunch of YouTube tutorials on how to do things, and it really it's been paying off. And I it's. It, it, it's just the only art I do, really, and I really like it, and it's so sad, but I really enjoy it. But thank you. I, I appreciate the compliment. I'll, I'll, I'll say this. the um, uh, Being able to get off of work and have recreation that is not based on screens, yes. that that's the – if you want to ask me the one thing that the that, that hobby is, it's just – I couldn't do music because of uh, the the sound with the family and it didn't work. Uh, and I just couldn't. I I can't get back from a computer job and then start up a computer piece of entertainment. So, um. the, the, this was what exactly for me. It's like I could play a video game or I could do this. And at the end of the day, I have something. You know, I have a physical thing that I'm holding, and I'm proud of it. You know, I've 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 worked hard. It looks nice. And I was like, oh, that's well, that's good. So yeah, I did that. And so it's it's like you say, it's not a screen it's a physical thing and it it's going to persist you know and so it's i i actually like that you know it's a I, real thing i probably i i would i could probably sell my army i i just want to do something with my hands and not have to be on the screen yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, i love i love it i love it but so anyway thanks right. thanks yeah. for having me man all right all right go get a good good going sargon have a nice uh <laughs> all right bye.